Eres tu hermano. Es. No, 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 sir. Ah. I just mute yourself once on Zoom. Last one minute to go. Mohit. Mohit. Yes, yes. I will say click for the animation part and next for the slide change. Fine, sir. Akshat, you got it, right? Yes, sir. Okay. Sir. All set. Shall I give the countdown, sir? Yes. Yes. Okay. Five, four, three, two, one. We are live now. A very good morning. I uh, welcome you all for this uh, oral ontology forum, a complete virtual summit. And uh, this is the second session, uh, completely focused on on psoriatic arthritis. And we had a very fantastic case discussion earlier on ulcerative arthritis. And this session is uh, we completely focus on psoriatic arthritis. And as you know, psoriatic uh, arthritis is not not only disease of skin and joints. It has got various uh, systemic complications. And 30 to 40 percent of our patients with psoriatic arthritis are not responders. So, with this focus on mind, uh, uh, we have uh, uh, six interesting uh, case discussions by the eminent rheumatologist uh, throughout India, and we also got uh, master class sessions from Dr. Atul Diyodar, an international lead expert in uh, psoriatic arthritis and spinal arthritis, and we have Dr. Uh, Ramesh Joyce uh, from Bangalore, and. Uh, Uh, we have uh, expert faculty moderators uh, dr jan mathu from uh, cmc lelo and also dr ganga ratna krishna from mangalore so with this brief introduction we would like to start this summit uh, with a welcome address from dr arvind chopra sir and to introduce uh, dr arvind chopra sir he is a eminent rheumatologist uh, from india and he is represented represented in indian rheumatology worldwide and has got more than 40 years uh, clinical experience in this field And he is the uh, uh, he did his undergraduation and post graduation from Armed Forces Medical College Pune, and he has got many research publications and awards. And he was awarded a first IRA Master Award in 2019, and he is the coordinator WHO ILR for Cancer Study 2005 till date. And he is the founder and chairman for the Bone and Joint Decade India, and he is also the ambassador for the state uh, worldwide. And uh, He is currently working as a director and clinical uh, chief rheumatologist, uh, Center for Rheumatic Diseases, Pune. Uh, with this uh, brief introduction, I would like to invite Dr. Arvin Chopra sir for his welcome address. Over to you, sir. Uh, thank you, Dr. Dumodran. Good morning to all of you. Uh, uh, it's my uh, uh, indeed my privilege to welcome you all to this wonderful uh, conference and the second and the last uh, day of the meeting. uh first of all i uh, acknowledge with gratitude the wonderful work put in by ajit nalavde and his team members i'm glad that the corona virus could not stop them from producing such a wonderful webinar based meeting so congratulations to all of you to all the speakers to all the participants so our uh, friends uh, uh, let me uh, begin by saying that the precise i think prevalence of psoriatic arthritis is not yet known in india but if i can share you my own experience from the cop cord studies uh, which were all india we had several sites almost 17 waiting sites all over india from north south east west and we gathered a data of, of more than a lakh population we were surprised that in actual population surveys we didn't find much of actually psoriatic arthritis so i believe that you see much more psoriatic arthritis in a hospital setting tertiary setting than what you actually see in a community setting uh having said that we have come a long way uh, since uh, uh, we uh, we can see from the literature 
the earlier descriptions of psoriatic arthritis. But I think it's a seminal paper, seminal paper by Morland Wright that every rheumatologist must read, which was published in 1973. I remember I, on my medical college days, I was at MBBS then, second year, I remember that. And later during MD days, this was a, this is a great paper. It, uh, uh, most of the things that uh, Morland Wright uh, described are still relevant, except that we've added some risk factors and we have added a little bit more of enthesitis, dactylitis. We've also recognized the role of um, uh, psoriatic arthritis in premature atherosclerosis and uh, coronary artery disease and some other unique features, but it's a great paper. Now, uh, if you know psoriatic arthritis, then I think you know a large part of rheumatology. Uh, one of the most striking features is that psoriatic arthritis is a very heterogeneous disorder. Sometimes the phenotypes really beat us in differential diagnosis. You could be looking at a single joint, you could be looking at a full-blown picture like rheumatoid arthritis, or you could be looking at actual uh, disease, or you could only be looking at dactylitis, or only nail disease, or only um, uh, ancestitis. However, it's the skin which is at the uh, at the at the at the root of uh, perhaps the entire syndrome. But we still lack good biomarkers to describe some of these very precise subsets, uh, which have overlapping phenotype but they are difficult to disease and they still challenge our therapeutic faculty. Uh, click, please. And uh, therefore, I think uh, it's important to remember that though we know a lot about the pathophysiology of the skin psoriasis, and we know a fair amount of uh, what happens in uh, psoriatic arthritis, we still have very little data how these two are connected. I think that's very important. And uh, uh, next slide. Uh, so, uh, uh, Yes, it's true that uh, uh, despite all that uh, we have, uh, I would say against methotrexate, there's much more for methotrexate. It is a cornerstone of therapy. We must remember that unlike many other autoimmune inflammatory disorders, uh, steroids have a contentious role, and maybe somebody will talk about it. There's been a revolution of therapeutics for psoriatic arthritis in the last two decades or so. Uh, most of us have had some uh, have had excellent experience with anti TNF reagents uh, over the last couple of years, and I, and I think uh, now we're in the era of uh, uh, blocking interleukin 12, 23, interleukin 17 axis. Uh, it's important to remember that what, what all we have today in the armamentarium of psoriasis, the response in the skin is much much better than the arthritis. I think, uh, in my personal opinion, I think we still don't have very effective long-term treatment for psoriatic arthritis, at least uh, even the clinical drug trials, though they have shown promising results, but I think there's a little bit of a problem. Hopefully, a uh, better mechanistic uh, grip on the disease will help us in uh, describing more precise drugs. And I do believe that dactylitis and is still continue the, the problem, though we've got wonderful drugs. Uh, psoriatic arthritis, uh, 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 we know a lot about the uh, pathophysiology and uh, there are several biologics. So we have some experience with interleukin 17 and maybe somebody will talk about it today. Uh, treatment of psoriatic arthritis biologics certainly is a challenge to our pronunciation. I think it's a real tongue twisters. There are, to my best of knowledge, at least there are four interleukin 17 inhibitors, sequinumab, ixikizumab, uh, bimikizumab, and brodlumab. And there are about four, I think, um, uh, interleukin 12, 23 uh, inhibitors. Most of them have been in phase two, some in phase three. Uh, Ustikinumab uh, data is very impressive. You've got Guselkumab. Uh, Risenkizumab is a promising drug in some recent trial, better than Ustikinumab, uh, even in skin. And then there's uh, uh, Tildrakizumab. You can uh, spend a week trying to uh, remember all these names. So I think with the, uh, and, and uh, yes, there are newer mechanisms of actions and targets which are still uh, uh, waiting to be explored. Uh, personally, I've been involved with CD6 inhibition. I think some of you were part of uh, a, a multicentric drug trial and room trial arthritis with etolizumab. We are very impressed and we in CRD Pune have had a very preliminary experience of treating at least 10 patients of psoriatic arthritis with etolizumab. And whatever I can say, the results are as impressive as what we could see with NGTNF. Uh, uh, unfortunately, this drug has not been further developed. It's approved for treatment of skin psoriasis. So, uh, uh, Prince, I think uh, I can now pass on the baton and wait for further presentations. 
Uh, there are several interesting clinical cases. Clinical cases certainly provide unique flavor to our understanding of the disease. And uh, uh, my friend Atul, who's going to come later in the day, is a truly a master and uh, uh, basically a Pune boy. So we are, we all are very fond of him, and uh, I'm sure his heart beats and bats for Pune very often. So thank you very much. It's been great uh, uh, attending, organizing this particular meeting with Ajit, with whatever little we have contributed. Uh, good luck and best wishes to all of you for a wonderful Sunday spending with psoriatic arthritis. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir, uh, for your uh, wonderful introductory remarks on uh, and complete overview on psoriatic arthritis. And uh, now we have uh, we're going into the interesting case discussion part. And we have got the three interesting cases on uh, psoriatic arthritis, and uh, the, the, the three cases will be discussed in 30 minutes, followed by a discussion, a 15 minutes discussion. And for that, we have uh, uh, three case presenters: uh, Dr. Hema Yam, assistant professor of rheumatology, uh, Stanley Medical College, Chennai, and we have got uh, Dr. Manoj Khatri, uh, consultant rheumatologist, uh, Medical Jodhpur, and we have got Dr. Abraham Mohan. Uh, consulted rheumatologist, uh, Caritas Hospital, Kotanen. So with this uh, introduction, I would like to invite our first speaker, Dr. Hema Yan. Hema, please. Yeah. Good morning, one and all. Um, I'm Dr. Hema from Stanley Medical College. So uh, I would first uh, thank all the organizers of World Rheumatology Forum and also my special thanks to Dr. Vinod Ravindran sir for giving me this opportunity. So my case, uh, he is a 35-year-old male. He got admitted in General Medical Ward in March 2019 with complaints of pedial edema, fatigability and frothy urine. Um, history of no, there is no history of breathlessness, oliguria or hematuria. There is no history of fever, sore throat or abdominal pain associated but he gave history of joint pain. The patient was taken over by the nephrologist in view of elevated renal parameters and in view of elevated uh, uh, protein creatinine ratio, the renal biopsy was also planned. Uh, since the patient had polyarthritis, I was called in for opinion. And probing his history, he gave history of psoriasis for past three years, but he was not on any uh, allopathic medications. He was only on Imani medicines on and off. Next slide, please. So clinical examination revealed his vitals were stable. He had psoriatic patches, both healed and fresh patches. And his musculos he had uh, a scalp psoriasis also. His musculoskeletal examination revealed he had a thoracic kyphosis. He had an active knee and ankle arthritis. His fibers was bilaterally positive. And his showbus was also positive. He had severe low back pain. He was not able even to stand. So I made a provisional diagnosis of psoriasis with psoriatic arthritis with CKD. Next slide, please. So these are the investigations on the day of admission. His total count was normal. His hemoglobin was low, like it was 6.4, and his platelet was elevated, like 8.6. And he has a very high ESR of 60 by 138. And his urea is 51, creatinine is 2.5, and his urine albumin was 3 plus, and urine PCR was 9.93. And his renal dropler, which revealed no renal artery thrombosis, and his ultrasound KUB revealed a bilateral grade 2 medical renal disease. His peripheral smear showed a microcytic hypochromic anemia. And from my part, I asked for these investigations. His sacroiliac -like joints, MRI showed a bilateral asymmetric sacroiliitis. His HLA B27 was negative. Uh, in view of starting, I mean, uh, uh, starting a further uh, treatment, I asked for viral markers, HIV, MAN2, and CT chest also, which are all normal. Next slide. So this is a clinical photo of the patient. You can uh, nicely see the healed psoriatic patches actually. And you can also see a thoracic kyphosis like prominent scapula blade. Next slide. And the renal biopsy came and there's a report. Uh, his, uh, uh, he had the renal biopsy report revealed um, uh, suggestive of amyloid, uh, which showed uh, this is a Congo red stain. We showed an apple green bifringens and a polarized microscope and this is under uh, this is a PS uh, strain which shows a silver negative material and this is one which shows the amyloid deposition next slide so this is clear okay this is a glomerulus cut you can see the amyloid deposition here pink amorphous material this is suggestive amyloid so I revised my diagnosis next slide 
So I revised my diagnosis as a case of psoriasis, psoriatic arthritis with renal amyloid. So uh, since I thought like um, the patient would benefit from a biological therapy rather than the synthetic DMARDS, which I couldn't start in this patient because he had a CKD, I discussed with a nephrologist regarding the pros and cons of starting a biological therapy. Initially, nephrologists were a little reluctant in starting TNF alpha blockers in him because they were I mean, for the fear of infection and so on. So we had a detailed discussion with them and. I planned to start an injection in Fliximab. So I gave him uh, an infusion of injection in Fliximab, 200 milligram as a, a regular standard protocol of zero, two and six weeks. And then I gave him monthly um, um, therapy. So the patient received a total dose of nine doses of injection in Fliximab along with, uh, I gave him a tablet called Chosin also. Uh, till December 2019, he had received in Fliximab. But uh, since the government medical college, there was little difficulty in availability of the drug. So he didn't receive the drug for two months. Uh, so he presented in February 2020 again, slide please, yeah, with a flare of the disease and uh, was in renal function. But during the course when he received the drug, his renal functions improved dramatically and his urine protein and PCR also decreased. So I restarted him on injection in Fliximab again in February 2020. Next slide please. So this is a, um, a slide showing how his renal functions improved with the infliximab therapy. This is the initial thing you can see like uh, his ESR is very high, 60 by 138. This is at the end of December, October. You can see how drastically the ESR has come down. And also the urine albumin, which was 3 plus at the start of therapy, has dramatically decreased to 1 plus. And to the surprise, the urine PCR came down dramatically, dramatically to 1.2 um, uh, compared to the previous, which was 9.93. So again, this was in uh, February when I restarted the drug. See, uh, at the time of admission, again, his urine protein was 3 plus and his urine PCR was 5.89. This is the time which I initiated the drug again. Next slide. So the cause of the patient was like the patient didn't come for follow up after that, like uh, after he received the last dose in February 2020 because of the fear of COVID everywhere, but he presented to my OPD again in June 2020 with severe oral ulcers and he gave a generalized fatigability. So his basic investigation at that time again revealed an elevated uh, urea, creatinine, OTPT, his ESR and CRP is very high. So I thought of uh, like a patient maybe having a COVID positivity. I asked him to get admitted, but that time we had a florid COVID cases in our uh, government medical college. So he refused to get admitted. But again, I received the patient in a, uh, a intubated state to an ICU. He had, uh, he was diagnosed to have COVID positive outside and he had features of DIC and MODS and but the patient succumbed to illness in spite of the treatment. So why my case is important here is the early onset of amyloid in psoriatic uh, patient whose disease duration is very very less like three years duration he had psoriasis he had psoriatic arthritis and also renal amyloid that's why I wanted to focus this patient but again I want to focus second point is he had a very good response to the TNF alpha blocker even though we don't have a specific drug for treatment of secondary amyloid, treating a primary disease will definitely help in improving the um, uh, associated status. So here in my case, uh, controlling the psoriatic uh, arthritis and also psoriasis, he had a very good improvement in the renal status also. But unfortunately, he succumbed to COVID. Next slide, please. So this is uh, a slide showing the prevalence of um, secondary amyloid and rheumatic diseases. This is from annals of rheumatic disease. We, as you all aware of, you know, like amyloid is commonly associated with rheumatoid arthritis in our illnesses, like the prevalence is 5 to 20 percent, whereas in psoriatic arthritis, it was around 10 percent. And again, this is an UK based studies which showed the prevalence of amyloid in RA is 23 to 51 percent. Comparatively, in psoriatic arthritis, it is only 4 percent. Next slide, please. So uh, this is from uh, uh, Italy-based study, which showed that the peak incidence uh, of uh, uh, amyloid in a psoriasis could be like in the sixth decade, or it could be like around uh, after 10 to 12 years only, you have the manifestations of amyloid. It is not so in our case, which he had an early manifestation of amyloid. And the most frequent amyloid manifestations were in the kidneys. Yes, in our case also, we had the manifestation in kidneys. And the next will be in the GI tract. And in that study, 29% of patients 
patients suffer from pustular psoriasis and 86% had arth arthropathy also. This is again a study which was published in BMJ, like comparing the prevalence of uh, amyloid in uh, RA and psoriatic arthritis and also the um, like in the individual organs. Like you can see again, the prevalence in the kidney is very high and in uh, amyloid in RA, we have pre high prevalence in lung, whereas we don't have that in psoriasis. Next slide. I think I end up my case here. So this is, again, I would like to state that I presented this case because the early onset of amyloid in psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis are in very good response to TNF-alpha blockers. I have chosen uh, infliximab uh, because I thought it could be very efficacious in this patient. Thank you so much. Hello. Good morning, everyone. I'm Dr. Manoj here. Uh, I'm present next slide, please. Uh, I'm presenting a 36 year old male gentleman's case. He was first psoriatic arthritis patient for me in my private practice, and he was one of the challenging cases that I've seen throughout my career. So he is salesman by occupation, but currently is unemployed because of his illness, because of both psoriasis and arthritis. So he has a history of psoriasis vulgaris for the last 13 years, with a history of arthritis involving small joints of hands and feet with large joints with dactylitis, enteritis, and low back care for around four to five years. He has been treated with NSAIDs, steroids, methotrexate, lefinomide, sulfasalazine, and cyclosporine in various combinations earlier. He had never visited a rheumatologist before this. He had visited multiple orthopedicians, physicians, and uh, he, has, he had even tried some Ayurvedic and homeopathic treatment, which has not worked well for him. Now, in February 2020, he presented to me for the first time with worsening of joint pain involving small joints of hands, feet, both the knees, ankles, hips, wrists, elbows, shoulders, low back pain and neck pain. He had pain everywhere. Along with that, he had worsening of skin lesions in terms of spread of skin lesions as well as worsening scaling of the skin lesions. Next slide, please. So on examination, he had chronic block psoriasis with around body surface area involvement of 60% with thick scales. He had super added skin infections on both the legs. Nail involvement was also seen in terms of oil drop sign seen in one nail and onycholysis seen in two nails. Uh, is both the feet were diffusely tender and swollen. Uh, both the ankles and knees were tender and swollen. Both the hips were tender and there was restriction of movement. Right hand, second and third digit showed dactylitis. First IP and fourth, fourth MCP joints were tender and swollen. Next slide, please. Uh, left hand, first, second and third MCP were uh, tender and swollen. And uh, first IP joint was also tender and swollen. Both the wrists were tender, swollen and deformed. Both the elbows and shoulders were tender. Whole of the spine and both the SI joints were tender. Amphysial tenderness was noted at both the ankle and certain ASIS iliac rest and posterior superior iliac spine. Other systemic examination was within normal limit. Next slide, please. So, investigation showed the anemia with hemoglobin of 9.3. His counts were raised like 18,700, probably secondary to skin infection, with, which were neutrophil predominant. Plated count was fine, but his creatinine was raised. It was 1.7. And we had multiple reports of his creatinine, which were between 1.6 to 2.2. So there was persistent raised creatinine in this case. Um, AST, ALT, LP were normal, and total protein and albumin both were low, probably because of malnutrition and the illness that he had. ESR and CRP were raised. Viral markers were negative. Urine RM was normal. Test X-ray was normal. USG, KUB was done to look for kidney size, and it was normal. Mount 2 now could not be done because of the skin lesions that he had on his, both the forearms and IGRA was done, which turned out to be negative. Um, I do not have much of the pictures of the patient, but uh, I have an x-ray which shows grade 4 SI joint changes as well as pro tissue acetabuli. Here I want to concentrate on one thing is uh, though IGRA was negative, but uh, unluckily I, I can't actually say that the EGRA was really negative because I have sent 22 to 23 samples from this place of EGRA and all of them have turned out to be normal and negative. Next slide please. So the, I diagnosed the patient with psoriasis vulgaris with 60% body surface area involvement with super added skin infection with nail psoriasis with psoriatic arthritis with peripheral arthritis or with tender joint being 40 and swollen joint being 34 with anthocytis, with masses of 9, with dactylitis involving 
two fingers and then spondyloarthritis was there nine by 10 his pain was was 90 and he had persistent dead gradient nephrologist has opined that it is probably second to nsaid abuse and he had diagnosed to have he was diagnosed to have nsaid abuse related second next slide please so i started some antibiotics gave him tramadol paracetamol and clonazepam for two to three days once uh, injection all on legs started subsiding i gave him intraarticular injections in both knees and shoulders and intralesal injections in dactylitis fingers later he was started on methotrexate and adalimumab so methotrexate i had started on 10 mg per week and then adalimumab i had given him first dose on 24th of february um after that in march patient there was lockdown he could not take the adalimumab regularly because of his financial condition also and uh, he came to me on 12th june when i gave him fifth dose of adalimumab in between he had taken four doses and actually his hips were bad and we had planned for thr also next slide please so on 12th june when i saw the patient he had tender joint of 6 swollen joint of 4 pain was was 30 there was no dactylitis massive score was 2 bas level was 4.8 and body surface area and volume was 30 to 40 so i think the response was quite good even though he had not taken the doses in so regularly as advisable so i was in favor of continuing the adalimumab uh, in more regular basis next slide please so on 25th july he had in between that period he had not taken even a single injection because of financial condition so he had presented to me with fever decreased appetite and weight loss for around one month examination revealed right atrial lymph lymphadenopathy um cct chest and abdomen was done which was normal except atrial lymphadenopathy fnc was done which was reactive we had a strong suspicion of tuberculosis so biopsy was done it was suspected of tuberculosis lymphadenopathy it was afp positive and there were ill form granuloma which i think is consistent with tnf anti tnf antibody use he was starting on adalim sorry att on 9th august and following this i advised him to continue adalimumab and paracetamol and advised to stop methotrexate and adalimumab next slide please so on september 12 i had seen the patient again the body surface area normal was just 30% which was almost same what i had seen two months back tendril joint count had raised to 12 swollen joint count was 8 pain was was 50 bas level 7.2 there was no dactylitis and mass score was 6 so patient had started worsening now but still patient was in better condition than what i had seen him in february so but there was one more issue here the patient had started consuming morphine and injection of pentadosin and uh, he actually demanded the same from me on the prescription i had asked him to see a psychiatrist but he refused to see a psychiatrist um knowing not what to do now i started on aprem last thinking that might work um but after 20 gram bd dose he started developing diarrhea it was he started once but because of chronic diarrhea we had to discontinue aprem last next slide please so case summary is 36 old gentleman with psoriatic arthritis with deforming arthritis enthesitis dactylitis and spondylitis with stage 3 ckd probably secondary to nsaid abuse who has failed on multiple conventional dmarts had partial response to adalimumab developed tb lymphadenitis on adalimumab is not tolerating apromelast and now abusing opioids so next slide please next slide so my i have two dilemmas here whether the use of opioids is justifiable justifiable i have personally used opioids earlier in patients of uh, spondyloarthritis just for a brief period of 4 to 5 days when the patient can actually get biologicals so i don't know because the problem here is opioid abuse is very common in this part of country so i was not sure whether to continue opioids now i think we have more options like tepentadol nasal spray probably it is a opioid but has got to less chances of abuse so that is one option i feel i can give now and which dmart to be started next and when the reason is the patient has active tuberculosis i searched for literature but i could not find much of evidence on what to start in a patient who is having active tuberculosis thank you so i have two questions that i have raised
I'll need the expert opinion from the speakers. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I am Dr. Abraham. I am from uh, Kottayam. I work at Caridas Hospital. I thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity uh, to present this case. And as well as uh, CRD Pune, we are at first seeing this case. So I am presenting a 40-year-old male who first presented with skin lesions, which are non-itchy raised rash, and which is extensive involving the upper limbs, lower limbs, as well as the back since eight years back, and which is followed by Incidence onset low back pain, which is in the lumbar sacral region with alternating buttock pain. It is characteristic of inflammatory back pain. The symptoms are solely progressive and uh, the course is characterized by partial remission and relapses. Patient also had associated symmetrical polyarthralgias. Subsequently, patient developed a uh, diffuse left leg and foot swelling with a non healing ulcer involving the left lower limb since uh, three and a half years back. Next slide, please. So there is uh, no significant past history and family history. Patient is a smoker since 20 years and he consumes alcohol four to six times per week. Treatment history, he is, uh, was started on hydroxychloroquine and sulfasalazine, which is eight years back. Two months he took monitor therapy and thereafter it was unsupervised. He's on homeopathic treatment on regular basis. Next slide, please. On physical examination, patient had bilateral pitting pedal edema, left more than the right. And he had extensive non healing ulcer over the medial aspect of left leg and ankle. And skin, there are extensive psoriatic plaques over the upper limb, lower limb, and back. On joint evaluation, on walking, he was noticed to have limping. Next slide, please. So we can see that here the patient had bilateral shoulder tenderness as well as elbow tenderness, bilateral knee tenderness with uh, crepitus, and bilateral sacroiliac joint tenderness. Next slide, please. On uh, extended cervical spine, he had uh, tenderness over the spinal process involving the cervical, thoracic, and lumbar spine, and there was restriction of movements of lumbar spine, which is present anti-reflection as well as extension. There were no tender points on examination. There were no other extra features on examination. There were no deformities as such. Next slide, please. So this is a patient. You can see the patient had a right elbow uh, synovitis. Next slide, please. The right leg uh, patient had some psoriatic plaques, which are healing as well as some pitting uh, pedal edema. Next slide, please. So this patient had a diffuse uh, left leg swelling. We can see that. And uh, there is some, there is an extensive ulcer which is there in the medial aspect of the leg, as well as the um, ankle. Next, next slide, please. So the patient's modified CRD Pune version hack score is 15 by 24. And uh, on assessment of pain boss, patient had six centimeter on a scale of 10 centimeter. And uh, grip strength was uh, normal in both the hands. And uh, early morning stiffness was present for three to four hours. Sleep pattern was disturbed and the patient's assessment of general health, health, health was 40 millimeter on a scale of 100 millimeter. Next slide, please. On investigations, patients had a raised ESR, otherwise the hemogram was normal. Patient had a raised CRP. His alkaline phosphate is raised, otherwise the rest of the LFT, liver function test was normal, renal function test was normal. Immunology workup, um, rheumatoid factor as well as ANA was negative. On uh, imaging, ultrasonography was done with arterial and venous Doppler. There is no evidence of any ischemia. There is no evidence of any varicose veins or deep vein thrombosis. And uh, the wound swab, culture and sensitive was sent, which showed no growth as such. Next slide, please. So, we made a diagnosis of uh, psoriatic arthritis with uh, lymphedema and pyoderma gangrenosa. Of course, other differential diagnoses were thought and we had excluded. We had done an imaging uh, which uh, excluded any secondary lymphostatic edema. We had done an ultrasound. There was no evidence of any tumor and uh, no metastasis. There was no Baker cyst rupture. No evidence of any deep vein thrombosis, neither varicose veins. Neither there was any evidence of uh, filarial infection as such. DD for the chronic ulcer, uh, first diagnosis of pyoderma gangrenosum. However, we inf uh, ruled out uh, infection with the uh, wound swab, culture, and sensitivity. And uh, imaging was done to rule out the vascular insufficiency as well as uh, any possibility of malignancy. And uh, ulcer biopsy, there is no evidence of vasculitis as such. Next slide, please. So um, this patient we had treated actually with um, disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drugs. We had used uh, methotrexate, leflunamide, as well as steroids were used. Uh, 
patients joint symptoms as well as ulcer had subsided but patient is getting recurrent ulcers as such biologics were not uh, used for this patient but the left leg swelling persisted as such so coming to the literature uh, lymphedema is an accumulation of protein rich interstitial liquid which has a result of congenital or acquired disruption disruption of the lymphatic circulation diagnosis is clinical and uh, other supportive imaging which we can use is isotopic iso isotopic uh, lymphosintigraphy uh, which is study the lymphatic circulation as well as mri ct and ultrasound indirect and direct lymphography are rarely used next slide please so the most common site involved is usually the upper extremities and the onset of edema is unpredictable and is not related to the arthritis duration or severity the radiological joint damage progression damage progression is related to the edema progression so we can see here two others Kale et al. He had uh, studied uh, the etiology of uh, uh, lymphedema in patients with psoriatic arthritis. See, so he found that inflammatory arthritis does not cause impaired lymphatic flow as such, and lymphedema secondary to psoriatic arthritis is multifactorial. Quarta et al. They uh, studied uh, two possible. Uh, they studied uh, two uh, two distinct causes of extremity distension, that is MRI and lymphosintigraphy. They found two mechanisms. One is tenosynovial inflammation as well as lymphatic vessel dysfunction. They found that patients with tenosynovial involvement and without lymphatic changes had a more favorable outcome to treatment. Next slide, please. So there are uh, some possible theories for uh, lymphedema in these uh, patients. So the most uh, commonly accepted theory is diffusion of inflammatory processes into the lymphatic vessels, which is a possible cause of chronic lymphangitis and edema. Chronic lymphatic vascular damage can induce abnormalities of the lymphatic vessels, which can lead to dilatation, lack of fenestration, or dermal distal blind loops with progressive and definitive damage and flow obstruction. There are many other uh, theories actually uh, involving venous obstruction, lymphatic obstruction with the fibrin, etc., which I'm not going into because of time constraints. Next slide, please. So the treatment uh, which has been tried is a trial of uh, Corticosteroids can be given. If there is no response to steroids, then uh, we can consider physical therapy with mechanical compression. If we find any response to steroids as such, uh, we can use DMARDs or anti TNF biologics. If the medical and physical therapy fail, then microsurgery, debulking procedures, and autologous lymphocyte injections may be explored. Next slide, slide please. So these are various authors which have tried various therapies in uh, patients with uh, psoriatic arthritis and limb swelling. So the first author, Selvarani and uh, Gru, they had two cases, one with tenosynovitis, one with lymphatic dysfunction. So they tried steroids in this patient. There was successful resolution of edema secondary to tenosynovitis. There is no effect on treating primarily lymphedema. In the next group, Cantini and Gru, they also used steroids. And they found that this had a positive result in treating swelling secondary to psoriatic arthritis in patients with predominantly tenosynovitis involvement. But in patients with lymphatic dysfunction, there is, it is not effective. Next group, Corta and group, um, they had used biologics actually. So they had two patients with MRI and uh, lymphocentigraphy confirmed tenosynovitis or lymphedema. So both patients' arthritis symptoms are resolved, but there is no improvement in lymphedema. And in the last group, uh, Lepka and group, the patient has psoriatic arthritis, had a left upper arm swelling, which was successfully treated with etanacept therapy. So generally, patients who had predominantly tenosynovitis involvement had a response, but uh, DMARDs and biologics didn't show much response in patients with predominant lymphatic dysfunction. Next slide, please. So going through the literature, the most effective therapy which has been for lymphedema has been complex deconstitutive therapy. And uh, this uh, involves skin care. Skin care involves moisturizing skin, protection from infection and trauma, manual lymphatic uh, lymph drainage, which is a sensitive massaging technique, which should be done by a trained person. And then uh, compression using a short stretch bandage uh, technique. So this should be continued till the arm swelling reduces. And then patient should be followed up with the maintenance compression uh, garment, which is used, which should be, uh, which is specifically made for these patients with the lymphedema. And then patient, uh, the last component involved is, is exercise actually. <clears throat> so otherwise, um, the treatment with uh, disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drugs has been inconsistent. 
in lymphedema generally. It has been shown to be more effective in other causes, lymphedema due to other causes such as rheumatoid arthritis as well as angspond. Uh, next slide, please. So, concluding, uh, psoriatic arthritis with limb swelling due to lymphatic dysfunction is a difficult to treat condition. Coexistent pyoderma gangrenosum further complicated the manage management of this case. So, limb swelling due to tenosynovitis may respond to steroids or disease modifying anti rheumatic drugs or anti TNF therapy. Uh, not gone much into details of pyoderma gangrenosum uh, literature because of the time constraints. Thank you. Thank you all presenters uh, for your wonderful uh, case discussion on difficult to treat psoriatic arthritis cases. And the case one and case three uh, clearly implicates uh, the use of uh, alternative medicines, which add a potential impingement uh, uh, to the uh, actual uh, treatment in these patients. So that we are seeing a garden variety of manifestations. Like usually, we don't see amyloidosis in psoriatic arthritis. But the patient was on many medicines, so which uh, the disease got uh, left untreated and is leading to amyloidosis. And similarly, case three, uh, this patient is also on uh, alternative medicines, uh, homeopathy medicines, and uh, the disease was left untreated and uh, leading to the garden variety of manifestations uh, where we don't see commonly the uh, these typical presentations like uh, uh, chronic lymphangitis and the. Uh, onset of pyoderma diagnosis on this on the top of this lymphangitis. And the case two is very interesting and that scores the importance of uh, uh, the pitfalls of quantiferon TB testing uh, in the uh, screen for tuberculosis, latent tuberculosis in uh, those patients who are going to start biologic agents. And uh, the lack of response to the uh, adult map in the case two is uh, probably because of the active TB infection which might have missed by the latent TB screening because in India like we send the samples to the outside and we don't know uh, because uh, in point different TB gold uh, testing like we need to isolate the lymphocytes immediately and we need to incubate at the centigrade. So when you're transporting the uh, blood sample, I don't know how uh, strictly we're maintaining. So that's uh, one important question. And definitely in the case two, uh, we can give sequence the like in that in a, uh, and in a meta analysis of uh, uh, more than 2,000 patients, uh, in among the 2,000, uh, more than 2,000 patients, among them, 132 patients who has got a uh, disease, uh, all these patients are safely treated with sequelumab. I think in the second case, a sequelumab should be the ideal option. So, with this uh, uh, brief introduction, like I want, I want to go to the audience uh, question. Uh, 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 this is uh, 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 for pyoderma gangrenosum, uh, Dr. Abraham. Uh, yes, sir. Did you done uh, colonoscopy in these patients to rule out the IBD related pyoderma gangrenosum? Uh, no, colonoscopy was not done for this uh, patient. Patient had an obvious etiology in the form of uh, psoriatic arthritis, and there are no uh, there's no symptoms at this day of uh, inflammatory bowel disease as such. Anyway, screening colonoscopy was not done because we had an already uh, established diagnosis as such. Yes, you can, uh, Dr. Rajeshwar, Madam, suggested that we can do a uh, fecal calculation uh, level estimation to go to the systematic And uh, uh, Dr. Rajeshwar, Madam, again, asked you, can you try it on a set uh, or cofacitinib in the second case? But definitely, because this patient has got active tuberculosis. So, both tofacitinib and detonacid may not be a good option. Uh, Sikukunumab may be the ideal option. And uh, Dr. Vikas Sharma uh, asked one question. Uh, did you rule out Burgess disease uh, in case 3? Dr. Abraham? Pardon, sir? Uh, did you rule out Burgess disease? Because this patient is a Yeah, disease. Burgess disease was ruled out. We had done an arterial Doppler as well as venous, uh, venous Doppler. And... Uh, uh, there is no evidence of uh, Burgess disease as such. Yeah. So there's another question. Can we use, uh, from Dr. Vijay Prashanna, uh, can we use aprimalast along with the TNF inhibitors or interleukin-17 inhibitors? 
Yes, uh, there may be a rationale to use, but the uh, most common combination uh, we use is methotrexate along with uh, this anti TNF for uh, that is uh, to prevent the development of anti chimeric anti autoantibodies. Uh, and then uh, there is another question from Dr. Ekash Sharma Did you rule out heavy metal poisoning in case 3? Heavy metal poisoning? Yes. Uh, I think this should not be relevant uh, in this case. And there is another question for uh, uh, case 3, Dr. Abraham. Is the lymphedema yes. related to disease activity? Lymphedema is not necessarily always uh, related to disease activity because once the damage is set and the lymph, uh, lymphatic vessel damage is set, it, it can turn into a chronic lymphedema. So not necessarily uh, of course, uh, patients who have more disease activity and have a chronic disease are more li likely to develop these complications, who have uncontrolled disease. Yes, there's another uh, question from Dr. Rajkiran. Is lymphatic dysfunction commonly bilateral or can be unilateral? It is commonly unilateral. Most of the cases, what they have seen in the literature, it involves upper limb and mostly it is uh, unilateral in these cases. I, as far as I've gone through literature. And Dr. Ankul Dalal uh, is asking uh, to case one, uh, oh. is the, if the patient presented you first time uh, in the COVID-19 pandemic, what is your approach to your Sir, question sir. If the patient presented to you during the COVID pandemic, so how do you approach the patient? Which means like first time a case of psoriasis, psoriatic arthritis, the renal amyloid. So in yeah. that uh, COVID scenario, definitely I will not put on uh, biological therapy, first point. Second thing, uh, regarding the renal status, probably I may just uh, stop the tablet cultures in because uh, other drugs cannot be given. And I couldn't consider methotrexate or lefnonamide in this patient if he is found to be COVID positive. If he is not COVID positive, then we can put him on uh, probably lefnonamide may be my first choice because methotrexate stands second in the presence of renal dysfunction. So uh, in the COVID status, definitely no biological therapy. If at all I need to consider biological therapy, probably I would have considered etanacept rather than infliximab. And second, synthetic DMARDs I would not have considered in this patient because uh, his disease activity was very, very high and uh, we don't know like how long will the COVID go on, so I cannot uh, keep the patient disease activity active. So I would have considered uh, biological therapy. Yes, if so, probably um, it an asset. Uh, second choice could also be an secukinimab, but uh, um, yes, like you can consider either it an asset or secukinimab safely, but with the patient concerned and explaining to the patient about the COVID situation and the risk of infection. And uh, actually, uh, in the case one, the source of the serum amyloid associate is not only from the liver, but it can also from the adipocytes and also from the skin. Also, the skin is also an active source for uh, uh, SSA. And uh, the, uh, uh, is there any studies of the role of uh, citoplasm in uh, uh, in uh, amyloid associated uh, amyloidosis in psoriatic arthritis? Uh, uh, sir, I have gone through a literature where it was found that IL-17 per se is involved in the pathogenesis of amyloid, serum amyloid proteins and amyloid fibrils. But there, I couldn't find any study which has used the QQNMAB in the presence of amyloidosis. So, I am not sure of it. Sir. But there is one literature showed that TH17 and IL-17 is definitely a source of production of serum amyloid protein peptides. Yeah, actually, this patient actually responded very well to the anti of therapy, but unfortunately, this patient died due to uh, COVID. Uh, so, uh, with this, like, uh, we need to, uh, I, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Atul Deodhar uh, for his expert comments on all these uh, three case presentations. Go to Atul. Yep. <laughs> thank you very much. And uh, I want to thank uh, 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 Dr. Nalaude and Dr. Uh, Ravindran to invite me to speak uh, here. Uh, and I, uh, as uh, um, Arvind said, I am born and brought up in Pune. I went to BJ Medical College in Pune and did my MD medicine. And uh, then I went to England. Um, even though actually I am here as an expert, these are 
unbelievable cases. <laughs> I haven't seen anything like this in the US. When I left India, of course, that was many decades ago. I used to see these type of patients and uh, I have seen only two cases of amyloid. This is now, I'm, I actually taken some notes here. Uh, Dr. Hema's case was uh, unbelievable. I've seen, when I was in medical school in Pune, in BJ Medical College, my close friend, his father uh, was a radiologist and he died of uh, amyloid. He had rheumatoid arthritis, but he had long-term rheumatoid arthritis, very severely deformed hands, etc. That was the first case I saw when I was in medical school related to rheumatic disease. After that, I have not seen any case till I came to U.S., and I have one lady who has got ankylosing spondylitis. She's from India and she declined to take, she has got AS, declined to take biologics for the fear of side effects and she developed amyloidosis. I've never seen a case of amyloid so early and uh, I agree with Dr. Hema that this is very unusual to have amyloid so early. The literature that you quoted about, uh, there was one slide in your presentation about 10% and 15% and 20%. That is unbelievable to me because um, as far as, I mean, I, I don't know, I've seen thousands of cases and I mean, I don't know where that literature comes from unless it is completely untreated inflammatory burden. People should not be developing such severe uh, amyloid uh, of the kidneys or 10%, 15%. I mean, this is case reports. I, I don't really see that at all. Um, so uh, that just a comment. And so this is a very, very unusual case that you have. Uh, there was something about that uh, COVID that um, I just wanted to, uh, there may be some slight differences. How uh, So the American College of Rheumatology came out with the treatment guidelines because we were flooded. Uh, I mean, as you know, US is uh, worse than, way worse than India when it comes to COVID infections and the death rate and all these kind of problems we have. This evening I was looking at, we have got uh, uh, 3.15 lakh uh, people who have died. Uh, in the US with COVID. American College of Rheumatology came up with the treatment guidelines of how to deal with COVID infections uh, and patients with rheumatic diseases. So they said that, in fact, what the studies have shown from New York, where uh, we have got friends who admitted patients with COVID infection on biologics, strangely, their outcome was not worse than people who were not on biologic. That's point number one. Point number two, people who were on biologics, at least in the US for rheumatic diseases, the admission rate into the hospital was not increased. And in fact, it was reduced. So TNF, uh, so this is the uh, COVID registry. There is a international COVID registry. People from all over the world have put in their patients into the COVID registry. They found that patients who were on TNF inhibitors had less likelihood of getting admitted to the hospital. Now, this could be a certain main bias. A certain main bias is that these people were more cautious. They were washing their hands. They did not get out of the house. They were very, very cautious. And that's why they had less likelihood of getting admitted. But the December issue of Arthritis and Rheumatology Journal, there is an editorial by a, a French uh, a doctor. And he says that there may be a possibility that of course, as you know, cytokine storm is a major reason why people die. And if people are already on TNF inhibitor, that might be, in fact, protective, which I think is a little bit far-fetched. Um, I, But who knows? I mean, we, we, we several things we don't know. So the American College of Rheumatology Treatment Guidelines say that if you see a patient with active psoriatic arthritis, active rheumatoid arthritis during the epidemic, during the pandemic, please treat him as if there is no COVID. The patient needs to take all the precautions, but you need to treat the patient exactly the way you would treat otherwise. If the patient calls you and says that now actually I have got COVID, then yes, you tell the patient to stop taking the biologic. But uh, if they don't have biology, if, if they don't have COVID infection, then they should be treated uh, just uh, the way they should be uh, otherwise. Uh, and, and yes, th th there is one um, way back, I was looking at this literature, I haven't seen the literature about uh, TNF inhibitors reversing amyloidosis. There is at least one study, and I, I, I have got some slides somewhere in my presentations, which showed that um, uh, this is actually ankylosing spondylitis, but treatment with infliximab reversed amyloidosis in patients with ankylosing spondylitis. So your uh, experience uh, is, is true that... Uh, uh, Adlimumab reverse it, uh, but great case. And uh, same thing with Dr. Uh, Manoj Kumar's case and uh, 
that was that protrusio acetabuli that is unbelievable i mean yes that person definitely requires hip replacement and um i agree with dr damodaran that secukunumab would be the best drug here secukunumab should not really have any any um risk as far as tuberculosis is concerned guselkumab we are at least in the studies looks unbelievably safe same is ustrekunumab so il1223 inhibitor and il23 inhibitor in the guselkumab two large studies of course clinical trials you have to take it with a big pinch of salt when it comes to infection risk because there are less number of patients followed for a short period of time but in the guselkumab trial the infection risk in the guselkumab was as bad as placebo no difference whatsoever ustrekunumab has a very large data set which is il1223 as you know inhibitor and there again the infection risk is less il17 inhibition risk for tuberculosis is also less much lower than um a tnf inhibitor so i would agree with dr damodaran that secukunumab would be a good drug and guselkumab i wrote down would be another good drug and um i didn't see that dr manoj kumar's case was um, so sulfasalazine and leflunamide was also tried or was not tried i don't know whether you tried that um you you are you are not yeah they had been tried earlier before the patient presented to me he had been on medications last 10 years and had tried cyclosporine leflunamide sulfasalazine yeah. polytrex and then along with that he had even tried ayurvedic and homeopathic medications yeah um cyclosporine would be a problem a problem with uh, and methotrexate mm-hmm. would be a problem with somebody with renal function yeah. abnormality yeah. um and i don't know whether you ever do um combination therapy or not and that's not really been tried and in my talk i'm going to talk a little bit about that uh, that there is a lack of uh, information about uh, combination therapy of a uh, conventional synthetic demards in psoriatic arthritis and uh, probably the data should come from india mm-hmm. um uh, but, but but great case i mean uh, we uh, we still see tuberculosis uh, in in the us we always do uh, the igra uh, we do the uh, quantiferon gold test uh, here um and it, it's it's pretty sensitive and specific for us and uh, we rarely see uh, generally tuberculosis in the us is limited to people with hiv or people who are homeless or who are in the who are in jail or prison or that kind of thing it's uh, not common obviously as 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 it's in india uh but again uh, amazing case and uh, you had two questions and so your first question was should we be using um, okay. um opioids and i i agree with you i mean i i, I worry about using opioids in india it is very difficult in the us the way we use opioids is not really possible the way you would be using because we actually get the patient to write sign a document which says that i will only take uh, opioids from uh, dr manoj kumar and i will not take it from anybody else and they can then only you will be able to and the pharmacies their electronic uh, system uh, they will not give the patient opioids unless it comes from dr manoj kumar alone not from anybody else and that of course is not possible in india and uh, and of course uh, then the patient goes to somebody else and they, then we can tell the patient no you're not going to get uh, opioids uh, i think your second question was i forget what your second question was oh uh, which biologic should i start now and when i would so once you start them on anti tuberculosis uh, treatment then i would start them again on uh, uh, secukunumab which would be a great drug to start immediately uh, there is very limited risk uh, even for anti tnf drugs um well this person actually has anti tnf so this is not um, uh, uh, this is not um, uh, like somebody with just positive test but no obvious evidence so in, in for anti tnf you have to wait for the entire treatment uh, anti tubercular treatment is completed for secukunumab i would have started him along with anti tb treatment because the risk is very very minimal in my mind um dr abram's case was also amazing i have never i've i got one lady i remember in my practice currently she's 90 years old she has got bilateral leg lymphedema and she has got psoriatic arthritis and in her case i got no idea why she has lymphedema uh part of that also she has got some little bit of congestive heart failure so it's not just lymphedema it is regular edema because of uh, 
uh, her congestive heart failure, but most of it is lymphedema. And we are treating her only with compression stockings and manual lymphatic drainage and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Interestingly, the place where I work at OHSU, the wound care people are next door, and wound care and rheumatology for some reason we are next to each other, and I can go and get somebody and show them the uh, uh, the pyoderma gangrenosum. So was that pyoderma shown on the histology? And so you did do a skin biopsy and that showed pyoderma gangrenosum and didn't show vasculitis, right? It didn't show vasculitis. Uh, there were no pathognomic findings of uh, pyoderma gangrenosum. There were some non-specific findings, but uh, we concluded as on as a pyoderma gangrenosum based on exclusion because all other so, possible causes were ruled out. Right. Um, TNF inhibitors. So uh, we have treated uh, pyoderma successfully with uh, uh, with infliximab, um, and in fact, IL-17 inhibitors. They were trying for pyoderma gangrenosum. I haven't looked into that, but IL-17 inhibitors might also work for pyoderma gangrenosum. So both TNF inhibitor and IL-17 inhibitors would work. But uh, I have never, uh, apart from that elderly lady who's 90 years old, uh, I haven't seen this kind of uh, significant amount of uh, uh, lymphedema. Um, and uh, it is fascinating all those uh, pathophysiological mechanisms that you uh, that you show there. So great cases, amazing. I mean, I'm just uh, I admire the kind of pa patients you see and you deal with. So thank you for presentation, and uh, I learned a lot myself. Thank you all presenters for your wonderful uh, cases. Now we will move to the uh, next session, master class session, and we'll go over the other proceedings to the doctor John. It's my good morning, everybody. It's my honor to introduce uh, uh, Professor Atul Diodar. After his MD, he's a member of the Royal College of Physicians and a fellow of American College of Rheumatology. And currently, is the director of Division of Arthritis and Rheumatic Diseases uh, at uh, Oregon Health and Health Science University, Portland, Oregon, U.S. He has authored three books and several book chapters. He has edited special issues for journals, editorials, and has more than 150 peer-reviewed articles. And I know many of us would debate and discuss his articles during our Journal Cup sessions, and we are proud to have him here. He is a principal or co-investigator in more than 100 clinical trials. And his interesting research areas are novel therapies, as well as epidemiology, and patient outcomes in angspawn, psoriatic arthritis, and rheumatoid arthritis. Over to you, Dr. Diodan. Um, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Matthew. I'm going to share my screen and uh, let's see. Are you able to see my screen? Yes, yes, Dr. Diodan. Yeah, thank you. So um, thank you very much. And I'm delighted to be here again. I was uh, hoping that uh, I would come and visit uh, you in Pune because my mother, uh, my mother is 93 years old and she lives in Pune. And uh, when um, uh, Dr. Uh, Nalaude and Dr. Ravindran asked me, this was in, they actually uh, invited me last December or actually last November. In, so November of 2019, uh, Dr. Nalaude came to me at the ACR annual meeting in Atlanta and said, will you come to Pune and uh, give a lecture? And I said, of course, I'll come to Pune. I come to Pune anyway, uh, twice a year to see my mother. And so I'll be delighted to come and give a lecture. But then unfortunately, with everything got canceled. Uh, so I'm giving you a lecture from here. So this is a picture of, uh, this is from my university. Uh, what the mountain you're seeing is Mount Hood. H-O-O-D. This is uh, 13,000 feet, uh, so what, 3,500 meters tall mountain east of Portland, about 60 miles east. And this is a picture taken from my university. And uh, this is this is how it looks now. It is, we had a lot of snowfall recently. Uh, so um, I'm going to speak on difficult to treat psoriatic arthritis, but then after listening to Dr. Hema and Dr. Manoj Kumar and Dr. Abraham, I'm quite, quite humbled. And <laughs> your cases of uh, psoriatic arthritis are way, way more difficult than what I'm going to talk about. Um, in any case, I will sh give you some of the uh, glimpses of what kind of uh, difficult patients that uh, I see. I mean, uh, your cases had all kinds of difficult other things like amyloidosis and 
pedal edema and uh, lymphedema and tuberculosis and etc these are my disclosures and here is a case uh, this is the type of difficult case that we would see in the us so a former fellow of mine she, she's in private practice in central oregon she called me and said that she has a 66 year old male with psoriatic arthritis since 2009 a reliable upstanding man is what he called him he has history of peptic ulcer bleed coronary stents on uh, clopidogrel and he's on leflunomide sulfasalazine and epimelast and he has right sided uh, second and third mcp tenderness you know why it is confirmed by ultrasound bilateral mtp tenderness on squeeze and uh, but the skin was under very good control so not many tender joints uh, but a couple of uh, uh, joints which were swollen and tender but these were causing him a lot of trouble uh, only these two or three swollen tender joints was causing him difficulty in opening jars and doing his day to day activities his crp was uh, 8.4 and esr was 5 which i was struck by the amount this esr of 100 and 110 in the three cases presented to me we rarely ever see that type of uh, esr responses here and this guy had tried 11 biologics and failed so in the us biologics are very easily available as you know uh, the irregular use that you have that should be published and how you manage your cases because really the world needs to understand how you can use these biologics off and on and still get a good control we of course use them regularly and these are the different different biologics he had tried and failed and i'll come to this case again so this is a situation that i see where patients are sent to me saying that he has failed everything now you tell me what to do he still has got not as many swollen joints or tender joints that you guys uh, see in your patients but these are joints in his hands that he has difficulty in doing day to day um control so just over quickly this is just one uh, introductory slide i have about psoriatic disease and this just shows this is uh, oliver fitzgerald who's in the Ireland he put up this slide of all the present and you probably have seen this slide uh, many times in other people speaking but starting from the top left there is uh, uh, this enthesitis and uh, uh, an enthesiophyte in the um, at the injunction of uh, Achilles tendon insertion as well as plantar fascia this is uveitis and this is synovitis and this sacroiliitis and of course uh, significant arthritis plaque psoriasis and then dactylitis nail pitting uh, pencil and cup deformity and uh, involvement of the spine and so psoriatic disease is a multi um, uh, sort of different different domains are involved uh, and one has to take into account which domain we are going to use the treatment of uh, psoriatic arthritis has evolved and you all know about this the uh, and arvin uh, said at the start how psoriatic arthritis was recognized for the first time by mole and right uh, and then till then of course it was thought to be just rheumatoid arthritis with skin psoriasis uh, so non steroidal methotrexate leflunomide and then etanercept was the first drug and then four other biologics uh, anti tnf uh, monoclonal antibodies came and then ustekinumab apremilas came at the same time and these two drugs uh, brodalumab uh, is available but is available only for uh, skin psoriasis not available for uh, psoriatic arthritis and uh, by micizumab is yet to arrive and so these are the ones that we currently have uh, tiltrekizumab risankizumab and gusulkumab are the pure il23 p19 inhibitors abetacept is not a very good drug for psoriatic arthritis it is approved though and tofacitinib is approved and upadacitinib this re recent acr meeting uh, this year uh, had a two phase three studies of upadacitinib this slide shows all the phase three studies and uh, drugs which are available for us in the us to treat psoriatic arthritis so there are there are five anti tnf there are two il17 so that seven there is one uh, ustekinumab eight one apremilas 9 10 and 11 drugs which are currently available to facilitate and the uh, orange bars are the placebo and the blue bars are the uh, active treatment and these are phase 3 trials as you can see the anti tnf are more or less similar and um, i agree that uh, the original comments by uh, by uh, dr chopra that uh, the newer and newer drugs have become better and better on the skin however on the joints we actually hit a ceiling 
with the TNF inhibitors and we haven't been able to break that ceiling. We are still stuck at where we were. Uh, about 60% uh, patients get ACR20 responses. So there are all kinds of treatment guidelines. The ACR NPF treatment guidelines, uh, I was part of that uh, uh, just sing. Um, uh, Sardar, he is uh, at. Um, he was the first author on that, and he is also the first author of the RA treatment guidelines. He is in uh, Alabama. Uh, NPF is National Psoriasis Foundation, uh, and then there are the ULAR guidelines, uh, and then there are the Grappa guidelines. I'm not going to show you any of these because none of these really uh, do justice to what is happening in India. Because these guidelines are made for countries like United States and uh, um, Western Europe, etc. These guidelines, you, some of you might have seen, these got published just earlier this year. This is International League of Associations, ILR recommendations for management of psoriatic arthritis in resource poor settings. This is specifically, so, and Vinod Chandran, that uh, almost all of you would know, is one of the authors here and he was uh, one of the main authors uh, all these first five people this ajesh maharaj you also might know he is an um, indian gentleman a rheumatologist in south africa these treatment guidelines were written specifically for south america and africa they were not written for india because in if you read this they say that uh, aplar is developing guidelines and i couldn't find Applar guidelines, and uh, I could find Applar RA guidelines, and I could find Applar guidelines for axial SPA, but not for psoriatic arthritis. And um, if you guys have it, then I'm sorry, I, I couldn't find it. You can send it to me. But these are the treatment guidelines for resource poor setting, and I thought these should be really fitting for Indian circumstance. So, what they did was they did something called ADAPT collaboration. So, this is a 2009. Uh, adopt collaboration process. This has been published as to how to adopt guidelines published by others and you adopt it for your own country. So uh, classification criteria are uniform throughout the world because psoriatic arthritis doesn't differ in India as compared to US, the same disease, the same sort the classification. Treatment guidelines differ. And they differ mainly because of what is available, what is not available. There is tuberculosis there. There's less tuberculosis in the U.S., etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So to adopt other guidelines, there is this adopt collaboration process. And there are three phases. One is a setup phase, adaptation phase, and finalization phase. In adaptation phase, there is defining. You define the health question. What is the question for your uh, specific country and your specific area? Assessing the source recommendation, drafting a report, and finalization. And unfortunately, what they found, there was such a severe paucity of data that they just could not really form very good guidelines. Uh, so there were six guidelines. So these are the guidelines. Number one is the goals of therapy. And so they say that remission and low disease activity should be the goal, which all of us would agree with. But they said, beware, all symptoms may not be resolved. So just because you say remission and low disease activity, people may continue to have some pain. And that is because of damage. And I'll come to this point later in my talk. Screening and management. So number two, three, four, five, six. They said there is no evidence found to make recommendations. And they specifically looked at recommendations for screening and management of comorbidities like tuberculosis, as we were talking about. What to do? What drug to use? And we said sakikinumab, but I mean, this has to be really, these types of things have to come out of places like India or South America or et cetera to show to the world that this is how it is. it needs to be managed. HIV, hepatitis B, C, leprosy, how frequently we should be monitoring and what, what we should be monitoring. Safety and efficacy of pharmacotherapy in if the way you are using the drugs because patients cannot afford it, you give it uh, at an irregular uh, basis, but what is the safety and what is the efficacy? It's a very interesting question and we don't really have good data. Safety and efficacy of combination, as I was saying earlier, combination of uh, the conventional synthetic DMARDs or biologic DMARDs with them, safety and efficacy of biosimilars. So these ILA recommendations finally said there is no evidence found and they came up with a research agenda. And it is worth reading because uh, this type of research they said needs to happen in resource poor countries to show 
how these diseases can can be managed with the limited resources that you have i will not go into the details for uh, i don't have too much time uh, but this is an article which got published earlier this year in clinical rheumatology worth looking at all right 10 reasons for the difficult psoriatic arthritis patient the way we look at it and of course this is i have changed it for uh, indian circumstances so poor health care access and inability to afford biologic that obviously is going to make your life very difficult to treat your patient poor health literacy follow up is difficult non adherence to treatment allopathy mistrust and these people have side effects to everything this is the nocebo effect which is opposite of placebo placebo as you know in latin means i will please nocebo in latin means i will harm and nocebo effect is that oh allopathy is bad and i will take homeopathy and i'll take naturopathy and i'll take unani medicine late entry to rheumatology care and now from 6 onwards is the problem that we should that we face failure to differentiate inflammation and damage enthesitis or enthesalgia people keep on complaining of pain and you think it is enthesitis wrong diagnosis and i'll come to some of these ex uh, uh, expl explanations about that unrealistic expectation from the patient and from the doctor and then there are these social media patients i have done my research on whatsapp i changed it actually patients come and say doctor i know everything i have done my own research on google and uh, internet and i want this drug i want etanercept and that's the drug i want and i i know everything i mean just prescribe that to me and so these are the these are kind of difficulties and first five of them and actually i should put these up these are i don't know that we are going to discuss them in today's talk because there is very little that i can offer though i i got some um, suggestions in this one we are mostly going to discuss these last 6 to 10 so i'm sorry about this i should have uh, looked at this how this comes up um but look at the first five the first five poor health care access and inability to afford biologics i mean i don't know how easy it is to get biosimilars in india and whether they are really cheap or not in britain um, infliximab is 85% cheaper if it is biosimilar so 15% price and in same thing in norway and i got no idea how easy or difficult it is to get in india and how expensive that is the next three poor health literacy non adherence and allopathy mistrust we have to really do patient education because without that uh, tackling this issue is going to be very very difficult as far as i'm concerned late entry to rheumatology care um american college of rheumatology has done a great job in educating other professionals what is rheumatology i mean even in the us people don't understand what is rheumatology and what rheumatologists do this is something that ira should do indian rheumatology association this is professional outreach reaching your other colleagues to tell them what is rheumatology and how we can bring in what we bring into the table so beyond that i i'm going to discuss mostly 6 to 10 in my talk so number 1 is failure to differentiate between activity and damage when we say that my patient is not responding are we differentiating between active inflammation and chronic damage am i treating chronic damage by changing the biologics this is what happens in the us and what is sometimes what is bothering the patient isn't fixable they have social economic psychological issues they may have central sensitization and so what we are thinking they have enthesitis is really enthesalgia i mean there is no such word as enthesalgia we created this word but you understand this this is the enthesitis and enthesalgia they got fibromyalgia tender points they got tenderness but how much of that is because of central sensitization and by changing biologics are we really going to fix that central sensitization is pretty common in rheumatic diseases and um, i have shown here at the very bottom is psoriatic arthritis is about 17 18% of patients would have and these are the authors and these are the papers uh, would have definitive central sensitization here is an interesting uh, uh, study which looked at the effect of the presence of fibromyalgia on the common clinical disease activity indices in patients with psoriatic disease so this is a cross sectional study and what they found out was that the cpdi dapsa das28 mda these have significant amount of patient reported outcomes and they were definitely different they were worse in patients with psoriatic arthritis and fibromyalgia compared to those who only had psoriatic arthritis but then look at the next three crp pasi and 
swollen joint count these are objective methods the objective outcomes and they are not different the p values are not significantly different so patient reported outcomes are definitely different in patients if they have got fibromyalgia along with their psoriatic arthritis depression there is also a high prevalence and so uh, there is a increased risk of uh, depression and suicidality in several of these cases so damage versus active inflammation is a very important thing that as rheumatologists we need to look at and if you are going to treat damage with changing biologics the patient will never really get better there are psychosocial issues there is central sensitization and then there is this anxiety and more pain and hopelessness and insomnia and the chronic pain keeps on worsening and they keep on coming to you asking for narcotics uh, as we saw in the first case and if somebody already has got pretty destroyed joints then any amount of drugs is not really going to help so managing expectation is extraordinarily important could it be that we have got wrong diagnosis these are some of the misdiagnoses that we see inflammatory osteoarthritis overuse cppd and i'll show you a case of my own gout i have uh, been fooled in the past sapho fibromyalgia seronegative rheumatoid arthritis usually is the other way around uh patient has people call them zero negative rheumatoid arthritis when they really have psoriatic arthritis but sometimes it's the other way around also early phase of connective tissue disease infectious arthritis whipple's disease neoplasia rs3 pe etc the uh, pseudo psoriatic arthritis or cppd i had a lady that she had psoriasis and she had puffy hands and she had classic synovitis of her mcp bilaterally symmetrical she was elderly she had mcp subluxation the x ray kept on showing non erosive arthropathy and they showed chondrocalcinosis but i was convinced this is psoriatic arthritis i tried all kinds of drugs on her she did not respond to any biologic whatsoever and after i gave up and i said this really is cppd arthritis cppd we know can cause pseudo uh, can cause pseudo gout but cppd arthritis can cause pseudo ra and can cause also pseudo psa by in especially in elderly people it can look bilaterally symmetrical swollen joints mcp pip distribution even subluxation and that is not really psoriatic arthritis that is cppd arthritis in the elderly inflammatory osteoarthritis as you know uh, they have got their elderly their dip joints are uh, puffy and swollen and we of course differentiate because they have got uh, um uh, knobbly sort of uh, bony things and x-rays look very different nails are spared is it sapho and why is sapho important and that is basically because these people could be treated with iv pemidronate um uh, and four cycles uh, this is not a treatment for psoriatic arthritis but sapho can be treated with pemidronate and their arthritis can get dramatically better Uh, psoriatic arthritis is commonly mistaken as zero negative RA, but the reverse is also true, and that is important because IL six inhibitor. And there is something that, uh, and I had heard this before also, etolizumab that uh, was mentioned by um, Arvind. And I have never, I have never used etolizumab and anti CD six. I need to uh, do some research on that. But this is IL six I am talking about. IL six inhibitor, rituximab, etc. We will never use in. um in in patients with uh, psoriatic arthritis but the patient may actually have zero negative ra gout in uh, in psoriatic arthritis now i have had patients who definitely have psoriatic arthritis and they came with one swollen joint and i tapped their joint and injected it with corticosteroids and to my surprise we found that there was uric acid and as you know there is rapid cell turnover it's a risk factor for incident gout and the age and multivariate adjusted uh, hazards ratio in this particular study by joe marola from new york for gout was 1.71 for psoriasis and 4.95 for psoriatic arthritis huge increase in the hazard ratio for gout in patient with psoriatic arthritis because of the rapid cell turnover so we have to keep that in mind also and then lastly of course we have to think outside the box and then uh, could we could could it be something else now this is unlikely to happen in india knowing that the kind of obesity that we see in the us you know in india that that kind of obesity is not seen but obesity is very common in the united states and very common in psoriatic arthritis and obese patients do not really respond well to the treatment and just drop of weight drop in their weight can improve their functionality 
uh, and their response to TNF uh, treatment. So weight loss, uh, 138 obese psoriatic arthritis patients starting TNF inhibitor randomized to hypocaloric diet versus self-managed diet. At the end of six months, more than 10% weight loss was associated with likelihood of achieving minimal disease activity. So weight loss improves that. And then uh, methotrexate, uh, uh, the SEAM trial, the MIPA trial that you know about methotrexate in psoriatic arthritis showed that methotrexate really doesn't work. So in the, in the West, in the US, people were suspicious methotrexate may not work. But the SEAM trial, which was a trial between methotrexate versus etanercept versus combination, showed that methotrexate is a pretty good drug. Now, this trial can be criticized because there is no placebo. So we don't know how much of this placebo response, but methotrexate works. And one of the ways to use methotrexate is to give, split the dose that increases the bioavailability or increase it to subcutaneous. And oral methotrexate going from 15 to 20 makes no difference at all, but injectable methotrexate makes a big difference in the bioavailability. And so I always preach here to use that. People who have all kinds of methotrexate complications and toxicity for mucosal toxicity for oral ulcers. In fact, uh, folic acid does not work for oral sores. What works is vitamin A. Very interesting. There is this particular paper which showed that 8,000 units of vitamin A, 70% effective in reducing methotrexate oral toxicity like ulcers. Neurotoxicity, patients complain that, oh, I get malaise and I feel very fatigued and this and that and etc. And dextromethorphan or is available here as uh, guaifenesin, but dextromethorphan with and after methotrexate, the dose of the day they take methotrexate, if you give them dextromethorphan and BID the next day, their neurotoxicity or fatigue and cognitive symptom and this and that, etc., gets dramatically better. So just a few quick slides about combination therapy. TNF inhibitors can be combined with IL-1223 inhibitor now. I'm again well aware that in India, it's difficult to get one biologic, let alone getting two biologics. It's also difficult in the US to do that. But there are these several interesting papers about combination biologic treatment, tacrolimus, effective in refractory psoriatic arthritis, and then therapeutic depletion of myeloid lineage leukocyte by adsorptive apheresis. I thought, oh my God, who does these kind of things? And intra-articular TNF um, in patients who have got one joint out of proportion to others. So there are several drugs that rarely used in psoriatic arthritis. I have said, uh, and these drugs are on the horizon. Guselcomib is already approved. Tildrakizumab, Risankizumab is not yet uh, available for psoriatic arthritis. And I said, IL-6 inhibitor, Rituximab, I don't use them in psoriatic arthritis, but think whether if everything fails, is this really seronegative RA? Cyclosporin, tacrolimus, bisphosphonate, it's SAFO, intraarticular TNF, and soon to be available, these three uh, JAK inhibitors, all of them are uh, JAK1 inhibitor and bimekizumab. And then in future, there will be these oral molecules, ROR gamma T inhibitors. GMCSF is not oral, and TIC2 inhibitor, there was a phase two study we completed and was presented at the ACR. So, last two slides difficult to treat psoriatic arthritis. Rethink the diagnosis, psoriatic arthritis that doesn't respond to your best treatment. Pain and damage mandates referral and team approach. Unsure of pain and problem, get medical imaging. There are 10 drugs that we haven't tried that you may not have tried. Methotrexate, we have to optimize it, split and inject it, know when to quit it. Don't be handcuffed by the safety limitations and use that vitamin A and other things if patients are getting side effects. Why is therapeutic deselection? deal with depression, central sensitization, fibromyalgia, obesity, and manage expectations and ask the patient which problem you want to fix. So here is the patient that I told you first, which was sent to me by my fellow. So I asked my fellow, have you tried methotrexate? She said, yes, of course, I've tried methotrexate, caused transaminases and AST, ALT. What about x-rays? There were no erosions, only joint space narrowing. So any fibromyalgia element? And she said, no fibromyalgia. So I thought, yeah, I agree with psoriatic arthritis, but I think it's mildly active. There are two or three swollen joints. And I mean, I, why are you trying so desperate trying to get rid of it? Yes, he has got some problem, but it's non-erosive. You have very, very well treated. So my advice was, what exactly are his goals? 
and have a frank and honest discussion with this patient. Enough trials of biologics, stop biologics, realistic expectation, and you need to probably use more intra-articular corticosteroids, non-steroidal gabapentin, and hand function if he has got problems with this. And will this progress? I said, very unlikely. You have treated him with all these biologics, all these years, there are no erosions, no joint space narrowing. So this, of course, in India will be very different because they may not get all these biologics and they would have severe erosion, severe joint space narrowing and significant damage. But there again, we need to have this kind of honest discussion as to what we can do with the given circumstances. I end with this uh, quote, the role of the physician is to cure a few to help most, but to comfort all. And I'll leave you with another picture of my university. We have uh, our campus up on the hill and we have got another campus next to the river down the hill. And we have these very fancy uh, trams, aerial trams, which go up and down the hill. Uh, you're all welcome to come and visit me sometime in Portland, Oregon, and I'll take you on these trams. Thank you very much. And I will stop sharing my slides and I'll take any questions that you may have. Thank you, Dr. Deoda, for that brilliant exposition on psoriatic arthritis. Uh, shall I just uh, start off with a comment? Uh, one of the things which is very interesting is managing the expectations of the patient as you exemplified in the case you presented. And many a times we end up doing it by changing drugs or changing biologicals rather than it's managing expectations. And just one more point I would like to uh, mentioned to you about that situation in India is we have an unregulated biological market and hence uh, we do face its consequences and this is one of the common discussions in our rheumatology forums. So that's two points I would like to make and uh, do you have a point on how do you manage uh, uh, active psoriatic arthritis in a pregnant lady uh, or how would you approach that? Yeah, so um Sertolizumab pegol would be the drug that I would be using because sertolizumab, as you know, does not cross the placenta. Uh, sulfasalazine would be, I mean, if she doesn't really need uh, that, sulfasalazine, low-dose prednisone, uh, those are other drugs that I might use. Plaquenil is not a very good drug, uh, but we have used that uh, in the past um, also. So plaquenil, sulfasalazine, low-dose prednisone, um, and uh, if they need a biologic, um, I would go to... Um, Sertolizumab, uh, because without, and I don't know whether Sertolizumab is available in the in India, but it's no, no. since it doesn't have the FC receptor, uh, it doesn't have the FC portion, it doesn't cross the placenta. I, I I didn't get your second point that you said. The first point you said was uh, uh, that you were telling me about two situations in India. You said there is uh, some market. Uh, the, I, I, the biological market is unregulated in India, so the an orthopedician or unregulated. So unregulated. Oh, so anybody can prescribe it. So that's one of the oh. common debates in rheumatology circles, which oh, we yeah. are looking at it now. After the arrival of tofazinib, which is cheaper. Well, it's not different in the US. Anybody can prescribe uh, biologics. So even the primary care doctor in the US can prescribe a biologic. It's not. It's not regulated. It's not that rheumatologists are required to prescribe biologic. Another interesting thing is places where there is significant large amount of private practice. So I'll give you an example of Los Angeles. There, because it is a private practice, very similar to India, and people go from one private practitioner to the other, uh, managing patient expectation is not done. And you want to show that you are better than the other competitor. Um, and so they keep on changing. It's amazing how different it is <laughs> when I go to talk to my friends in Los Angeles uh, and what happens in Portland. It's, it reminds me of India, how people kind of jump from one doctor to the other and the other doctor has to give something different because the previous doctor gave you that. And that just causes a problem. And nobody tries, tries to really manage expectations and say that, you know, I think this is the best you are going to get. I mean, rather than you, you will otherwise just remain very, very unhappy with your situation. Let's just uh, go to a question by Dr. Meha Sharma. Uh, she has a psoriatic arthritis patient which failed combination DMAX, adalimumab, and secukinumab. That's available biologicals in India now and continues to have active arthritis along with enthesitis and fibromyalgic symptoms. Uh, would you consider starting tofacitinib? 
Um, yes, but I mean, before I again jump onto that, I want to I want to know how many swollen joints. I liberally use joint injections, corticosteroid injections. If there are two three joints which are significantly painful, I would inject them with corticosteroid number one. And I want to know whether it's a primary failure or a secondary failure because finally, even we even in the US, we have got limited uh, drugs available, and I'm pretty conservative. If the biologic you said adlimumab failed, but then um, or, or one of the drugs you said anti-TNF failed, I would if it is a secondary failure, I would go to another anti-TNF failure, uh, another anti-TNF before going jumping to tofacitinib. But but the answer is yes, tofacitinib is a very good drug, and definitely I would try that. But rather than jumping the class, if somebody has a secondary failure, I would try another drug in the same class, and I would use joint injections more liberally. So there's a question by Dr. Malavia. Uh, name of the drug to improve methotrexate intolerance. Oh yeah, so um, gu guaifenacin, guaifenacin. Um, uh, so actually, it is a, a dextromethorphan. Guaifenacin is the one that we. It, it's a trade name, I think. Dextromethorphan is is the drug, and um, I'll, I'll pull up my uh, slide later on. But uh, dextromethorphan is a drug that is. Uh, available and you give it the day of their, so this is pa for patients who have got methotrexate uh, induced uh, fatigue and uh, tired and uh, th that kind of stuff. The day of methotrexate and then uh, uh, BID on the next day, uh, dextromethorphan. Uh, and uh, vitamin A was the one which I suggested for oral ulcers. Uh, Dr. Deodhar, uh, I'll just take the last question. There are many more questions. Would it be okay we send it to you, questions to you by mail and Absolutely. Uh, get it to Yeah. Thanks for that. Yes. The last question is, uh, what is what is the treatment of choice for dactylitis? Your treatment of choice for dactylitis. Mm. <laughs> That's a difficult one. Um, I have uh, I have injected uh, dactylitis in the past, and th there again, it's very painful to the patient. So I have given up on dactylitis. Uh, biologics are not bad at all for dactylitis. Um, there are uh, studies. So uh, IL seventeen inhibitors. Uh, I find probably better than TNF inhibitors when it comes to dactylitis, mostly because part of dactylitis is also enthesitis. Um, so uh, uh, TNF inhibitors would be my first choice, but then um, IL-17 inhibitors, I would quickly jump if dactylitis is causing a significant problem. Several times, patients might have dactylitis, which is chronic dactylitis, which looks swollen, but the pain goes away. Uh, and I, I just, I don't really, my expectation, I reduce my expectation and I tell them, this is it. I'm not, it's not hurting you. That's fine. It is swollen. End of the story. I'm not going to give you already on a drug. I have done as best as I can and I'm going to leave it at that. Uh, so I'm going to manage their expectation and my own expectation. But acute dactylitis is very painful. Chronic dactylitis, it looks swollen, remains swollen and it stays like that for months and I don't really get too worried about it as long as they're on some biologic so that they don't really cause structural damage to that toe or that uh, finger. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Deodhar, for your talk and the excellent replies we got for our queries. And uh, we thank hope you. to get, uh, we'll send you the mail for the rest of the questions, if you don't mind. Wait, thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you thank very you much. Very and much. Uh, best of luck and uh, thank great you. cases. Uh, yeah, thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Okay, bye. Uh, hand over to Dr. Ganga Ratna for the rest of the cases now. A very good morning to all of you. Uh, I thank the organizers for giving me this wonderful opportunity. And it gives me immense pleasure to introduce three eminent rheumatologists uh, who will be presenting very interesting and complicated uh, psoriatic arthritis cases. Uh, Dr. Abhishek Patil, he is the consultant rheumatologist uh, at Manipong Hospital, Bangalore. Uh, Dr. Nina Chitnis, uh, consultant rheumatologist uh, at Leelawati Hospital, Mumbai, and Dr. Soumya Jain, uh, rheumatologist from Saranpur. Uh, the first case will be from Dr. Abhishek Patil. Uh, over to you, Dr. Abhishek. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, at the outset, uh, I'd like to thank the organizers for providing me the opportunity and also for moderator for uh, fine-tuning my presentation. Next slide. Uh, this is a young male IT professional from Bangalore. Uh, he uh, is suffering from spondyloarthritis for nearly uh, one and a half decades. 
and uh, it was managed by uh, my senior colleague and uh, he i was involved in a scare only uh, march of the sia uh, at the outset in 2006 i was diagnosed with spondyloarthritis he had a very high disease activity uh, suboptimal response to uh, sulfasalazine and uh, uh, anti inflammatory drugs so he was uh, given infliximab between 2009 to 12 Uh, he received about 14 infusions or so and uh, thereafter he lost to follow up uh, two years later he was uh, he returned with uh, a much better disease and also requiring hip replacement so he was initiated on uh, once a week etanercept and slowly it was tapered off uh, to once monthly dose which we often do in our most of our patients so once the disease response is there we try to uh, de escalate the de- uh, biologicals there was no documentation of an at baseline next slide uh, so uh, for the first time he presented to our hospital in march of 2020 uh, he had a fever cough for 3 5 days and uh, there was no scare of corona at that point so he was confidently given azithromycin by a physician outside uh, he did not improve uh on the contrary he uh, continued to have increased breathlessness palpitation and uh, uh, then he developed chest pain and he was brought to emergency and in the uh, he, all along his disease activity was quiet next slide please in the emergency uh, he was noted to have a hypotension a low voltage uh, ecg complexes and um, he was also noted to have a large pericardial effusion with impending cardiac tamponade so the cardiologist went ahead and did a pericardiocentesis and the analysis of the fluid are on your screen it's uh, exudative fluid basically free of any infections next slide please uh, uh despite of this uh, he did uh, improve uh, breathlessness improved but he still continued to have high grade fever documented about 101 degree and then uh, chest pain so a pulmonologist was involved uh, in his care on second or third day and they got a ct scan done and ct scan uh, confirmed uh, what the echo had shown it it was showing a large pericardial effusion in addition he was having a large uh, left pleural effusion and a moderate right pleural effusion uh, but the underlying lung parenchyma was perfectly normal next slide Uh, so this is what his labs uh, basic lab work was normal liver kidney functions complete blood counts drop i everything was negative urine was normal uh, apart from a high inflammatory markers as you can see on the screen uh, the pulmonary medicine team went ahead with pleural tapping as well as pleural biopsy also uh, but again uh, tb expert was negative um, and uh, cultures from the pleural fluid were negative uh all along the he was also worked up for other unusual viral infections everything uh came back negative uh so he was continued on treatment with antibiotics and antivirals but his fever did not subside next slide and that's where uh, i w- i s- i was called in and uh, to summarize what i told it's just a young male with spondyloarthritis previously treated uh, with biological that is tnf blockers initial infliximab and due to cost concerns later etanercept and once a monthly dose who presented with a acute pleuropericardial effusion for 7 8 days and it wasn't responding to antibiotics or antivirals uh, so i considered uh, like my, my previous two colleagues that i considered uh, infective whether it's uh, bacterial or viral to be the first possibility later tuberculosis but i did also consider whether it could be a drug induced phenomena next slide so i ordered immunology workup and as you can see uh, the ana was uh, positive in a, a very high titer uh, anti ds dna by elisa was also strongly positive with a normal complements next slide please uh, so i considered i entertained the possibility of a tna induced uh, lupus although i never saw a patient presenting so late because of uh, this problem so i put him on a low dose of steroids prednisolone 50 mg per day and hcq uh, was started at 300 mg per day and uh, within 2 3 days his fever crashed and uh, his chest pain breathlessness everything was stable and we were able to uh, discharge him on a stable state over uh, uh, home uh, he later came up to me after a month's time uh, 
at that time he did not have any chest complaints the x ray was normal uh, but now the disease has again flared up uh, so he was in a lot of back pain and stiffness uh, so uh, we uh, i discussed this case with the, uh, my senior colleague who was handling him for so far and also with the patients i explained him the therapeutic options available and we decided to start him on secukinumab and uh, i last spoke to him about 2 months ago and he was doing well with once a monthly secukinumab next slide please so why did i entertain tnf induced lupus in this patient was because there's a good temporal relationship uh, from uh, the initiation of drug to development of symptoms uh, absence of any underlying lung problems and once the pericardial tamponade was stabbed Uh, the repeat echocardiogram showed that it is a perfectly normal heart that he had and all along there was a negative workup for infections he was quite thoroughly uh, worked up including a pleural biopsy and he had a very such a prompt response to low dose of steroids uh, but there were two things which were pinching uh, me one thing was uh, if it was tnf induced lupus why did it take such a long time to develop this complication practically was on etanercept for 6 years and i did not find any other uh, typical cutaneous or uh, um, joint manifestation which are associated with the lupus next slide please uh, so before uh, we address them uh, let us uh, go through why uh, tnf uh, blockers should cause lupus like reactions at all we all know that there is a inverse correlation between tnf and interferon so whenever tnf Uh, goes up it tries to you know it blocks the action of plasma dendritic dendritic cells and uh, this reduces the interferon production so whenever you have this break taken off by tnf blockers then you have unregulated plasma dendritic cells and which will uh, secrete excess of interferon and we all know that a hyperinterferon state is a fertile ground for lupus to develop also it alters the t helper cell profile and two other possible explanation could be because tnf blockers are potent immunosuppressives you might have a increased risk of infections and that in turn uh, may uh, lead to uh, polyclonal activation of b cells also in ra uh, there are studies which have shown that there is increase in apoptotic antigens after the use of infliximab and such a mechanism could exist for other tnf blockers also next slide please Uh, the incidence uh, i dug uh, into the literature and what i could find that uh, the actual incidence of uh, anti tnf induced lupus maybe is about 0.1 to 0.2% and it's a little higher for infliximab and least for adalumumab i did find few case reports of golimumab but uh, i don't i can't put it into a figure as of now uh, the maximum uh, Uh, interval between the initiation of infliximab and the onset of uh, symptoms lupus like symptoms what i could understand from the literature was 4 years but i thought if if it is 4 years why can't it also be 6 years next case the next slide uh, so uh, uh, just a brief slide highlighting what are the typical clinical feature of tnf induced lupus uh this was a, a work of uh, michelle and her colleagues and uh, what they found that they described uh, 33 patients with uh, uh, various tnf blockers who developed uh, lupus like features and uh, unlike other typical uh, drug induced lupus for example hydralazine procanamide what they found that these patients had a higher cut- uh, uh, proportion of cutaneous manifestation higher proportion of arthritis increase incidence of ana and very particularly dsdna antibodies were positive in many of these patients uh, with a low complements and also neurological and nephrological involvement was uh, often noted in this patients a uh, next slide Uh, so uh, there are no definitive criteria to diagnose tnf induced lupus but uh, uh, bandit et al they and colleagues they talk about uh, these steps uh, that there should be a good temporal relationship between uh, the onset of uh, symptoms and uh, initiation of drug at the patient should have at least one acr uh, clinical and one serological criteria and uh, they importantly note that other antibodies like anti ro antibodies centromere or even rnp or smith are very rare in tnf induced lupus although dsdna are quite frequently found uh, 
and there should be a prompt resolution with the initiation of withdrawal of the drug so all these uh, things were matching in our patients next slide uh so just one slide whether zero conversion to be monitored uh, zero conversion means uh, whether those patients who are ana dst and a negative uh, for non lupus conditions when we uh, initiate them on tnf blockers whether they develop ana through the line uh, through the time uh, well uh, uh, including the landmark trials for infliximab and rumatide that is attract and aspart trials most trials have reported such uh, occurrence and they reported that it occurs in about 40 50% on an average uh, but very rarely that we see that uh, these uh, uh, antibodies uh, lead to uh, tnf induced lupus because uh, tnf induced lupus itself is quite rare next slide please Uh, so this is highlighted by this uh, case series um, case review actually which uh, uh, you know describes various tnf induced lupus which have been described in later uh, literature so you can see that the an antibodies over a period of 6 months to 1 year can develop in as high as 70% of patients who have been treated with tnf blockers in non lupus conditions uh but the actual incidence on the right side you can see that uh, actual incidence of uh, tnf induced lupus is pretty rare next slide so i would like to give uh, a take home message from my presentation that uh, tn uh, drug in uh, induced lupus is very rare uh, with use of tnf inhibitors but uh, zero conversion is very common uh for a clinician a high index of suspicion is very critical uh and uh, the third point whether i should have used adalumab in my patient uh, is that whether i should have switched to another tnf inhibitor or would have, uh, i should have chosen a separate class of drug like secukinumab altogether is for open debate there are more and more series uh, now coming up that if you switch from one um uh, uh tnf blocker to another tnf blocker uh, the chances of recurrence of these autoimmune phenomena is very low but uh, as i told this uh, i discussed this with the patient as well as my senior colleague and all of us uh, uh, were more in for secukinumab and uh, uh, I, i'm glad that it worked for my patient next slide so that brings me to the next slide action thank you so i am very grateful for all of you to join me good afternoon everyone uh, going to my case next slide please so my case is of a 40 year old male he was a mechanic by profession hailing from uttar pradesh he was admitted in a hospital with history of asymmetrical polyarthritis since one year actually he was admitted under an orthopedician for a suspected fracture of phalanx and he was going to be operated in view of the asymmetrical polyarthritis a rheumatology reference was given on examination he had synovitis in the left wrist left first mcp and pip bilateral ankles and bilateral mtps he also had extensive palmoplantar lesions and for the pain he only had been taking anti inflammatories on and off and some alternative therapies like ayurvedic and homeopathic next slide please so the dermatologist confirmed the diagnosis of palmoplantar psoriasis we planned to start methotrexate after the investigations however his routine lab revealed an anti hcv positive status now honestly i do not do hbsag and anti hcv as a routine in all my patients before starting methotrexate however this anti hcv had been done as a part of his pre operative workup and it came to be positive hence a gastroenterologist was involved next slide please now the further investigations his viral load was very high about 18 million copies the genotype was 3 his liver function tests were normal the ulg abdomen was normal he had mild anemia rest hemogram was normal the crp was very high 157 and the esr was 80 next slide please now seeing the above investigations starting him on antiviral therapy became the priority so on discussion with the gastroenterologist he was started 
on directly acting antiviral therapy a combination tablet of sobuspivir and dactylasvir it contains sobuspivir 400 mg and dactylasvir 60 mg coming to the treatment of his arthritis the conventional dmards methotrexate and leflunamide had to be avoided due to the possible hepatotoxicity this patient was not affording tnf blockers we started him on cyclosporin 100 mg per day and with monitoring of his renal function test it was increased to 150 mg per day he also needed tablet diclofenac 75 mg twice a day in spite of which he was quite much in pain and also needed to be given steroids between 5 to 15 mg on and off next slide please in view of his active arthritis we discussed with the gastroenterologist and started the patient on sulfasalazine however he had a severe allergic reaction and sulfasalazine needed to be stopped next slide please now the patient continued to have very active arthritis as well as psoriasis in fact it worsened during his treatment and he kept on telling us that i was much better before i started this medication he needed regular anti inflammatories we also changed from one anti inflammatory to another but the he still remained quite active as i said he needed steroids also on and off and during treatment he developed mild anemia mild thrombocytopenia while he was on the antivirals next slide please so here our dilemmas were he had no relief with cyclosporin needed full dose anti inflammatories methotrexate leflunamide sulfasalazine could not be given and he was not at all affording for tnf blockers next slide please so somehow we just pushed on the 12 weeks so he completed antiviral therapy of 12 weeks at the end of treatment his hcv viral load was less than 15 he continued to have active arthritis at this point i had a discussion with the gastroenterologist about starting the patient on methotrexate however he asked us to stop for 3 months like withhold methotrexate for 3 months after 3 months we again got a viral load which was still negative his lfts were normal hence next slide please hence we went ahead with a fibro scan when the fibro scan came normal we decided to start methotrexate with caution and regular liver function test monitoring next slide please next slide please so within 3 months of methotrexate therapy the patient was off anti inflammatories and steroids he was on methotrexate 15 mg per week and cyclosporin 100 mg per day his liver function test continued to be normal in fact his hemoglobin also increased to 12 and he was doing perfectly well next slide please so to summarize we had a patient of psoriatic arthritis with concomitant hcv who was not affordable affording for biological therapy he had inadequate response to cyclosporin though methotrexate ideally should be avoided we started it with caution next slide please so going through the review of literature in patients who have psoriatic arthritis with concomitant hepatitis c cyclosporin is the drug of choice it is not only safe but it also has antiviral properties and helps in the treatment of hepatitis c methotrexate and leflunamide are contraindicated in all chyc plus classes sulfasalazine can be given in class a but it is best avoided in class b and c next slide please coming to tnf blockers tnf blockers are generally safe and do not cause reactivation of the hepatitis c in fact inhibiting tnf may be beneficial in hcv it has been shown that tnf alpha is engaged in liver fibrosis by inducing apoptotic pathways In fact there are small studies in which etanercept has been added to interferon and ribavirin to help treatment of hepatitis C and it has been shown to be beneficial however there are no long term studies about the safety so after treatment once the hcv viral load is undetectable we can go ahead with a fibro scan and add methotrexate with regular monitoring of the liver function test studies have shown that methotrexate is safe 
and does not cause reactivation of the hepatitis C. Next slide, please. Now, coming to the treatment of the hepatitis C when the patients have psoriasis. The earlier therapies, which were interferon-based therapies, had lot of side effects. They were known to, in fact, trigger and worsen psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis. Hence, in such patients, the directly acting antivirals are more preferred. So, in India, we get a combination of sobuspivir and dactylvir. They are more effective and have much lesser side effects. Hence, in such patients, though they are more expensive, they should be the preferred mode of treatment. Next slide, please. Thank you. <coughs> good, good afternoon, everyone. Today, I will be presenting an inter interesting case of inflammatory oligoarthritis, with which has a diagnostic dilemma. Next slide. I am presenting 27-year-old male who presented to me off and on painful swelling of right second toe since last six months. He had off and on painful swelling of right knee since last one month. Symptoms, these symptoms were sent since la last 15 days. He also complained of off and on voting from left eye associated with pain and redness. These symptoms were associated with mild pyrexia and painful maculopapular, re maculopapular rashes on plantar aspect of both foot. Next slide. On examination, patient has conjunctivitis in the left eye. On deep exam, psoriatic patch was present over the scalp and behind the left ear. Synovitis of right knee was there, right second toe dactylitis was there, bilateral typical foot lesion suggestive of keratoderma planar logica were present, rest of physical and systemic examination was within normal limit. Next slide. Now we started the workup, Investi investigations were sent and conservative management was started with NSAIDs and short of methylprednisolone to ease the pain and agony. Next slide. Here the investigation reveals some interesting highly elevated inflammatory markers. ESR was 68, CRP was 126, the rheumatoid factor, HBSAG, the NTSC was negative, CBC showed mild anemia and significant, one significant finding was that urine was full of pus cells, 45 to 50 WBCs per high power field was present and HLA B27 by PCR was positive, ANA was negative, X-ray chest was normal, X-ray pelvis was normal. Urine culture was sent, seeing the pyuria and uh, it showed growth of E. coli. Synovial fluid from the knee was taken, it showed 150 cells, all were lymphocytes with normal glucose. Next slide please. <coughs> so, probable diagnosis and treatment, we kept so, uh, psoriatic oligoarthritis plus minus reactive arthritis and treatment we started and said was continued. Antibiotics we considered according to the culture, nitroferentine was given for topical treatment of psoriasis, emollients, topical corticosteroid was used and sulfasalazine was initiated. After treatment of UTI, we added methotrexate and low dose steroids. N next slide. <coughs> After two weeks of follow up, patient did not show any response, rather his symptoms aggravated. He developed high grade fever. He developed generalized polyarthralgia and he developed new purpular rashes over anterior chest wall. Now, this worsening of joint pains and skin lesions with initiation of bilateral shoulder pain and stiffness was there. Next slide. We had a great, we were stuck there and dilemma was there. What to do despite being on giving treatment with methotexate, sulfasalazine, psoriasis lesions were uh, precipitating, patient arthralgia is increasing. So drilling more into the history raised suspicion of HIV, which came out to be positive by a CAR test and later on confirmed by Western blot. Viral load was 80,000 copies per ml and CD4 count was 320 cells. Next slide. Now uh, we reached to a conclusion that patient is probably having HIV with HLA B27 reactive arthritis because we had a triad of arthritis, urethritis, conjunctivitis. With, with coexisting psoriatic arthritis in view of asymmetric lower limb oligoarthritis and dactylitis. All drugs except NSAIDs and topical steroids were withdrawn and patient was referred to ART center. Now he is doing well on heart alone. 
with no DMRDs, no immunosuppressants given, only topical therapy and heart treatment is going on. Next slide, please. So, um, point of discussion is articular syndromes that have been described in association with HIV include HIV per se itself associated arthropathy, seronegative spond arthropathies, reactive arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, which is very common, undifferentiated SPA, rheumatoid arthritis, and painful articular syndrome. Next slide. HIV positive have higher risk of developing rheumatic disease. This can occur at any stage of the disease and there are again challenges in the management of inflammatory arthritis with HIV. Next slide. So uh, slide on psoriatic arthritis with HIV. Along with an increased occurrence, HIV infected patient with psoriasis have more severe and persistent skin lesions with guttate and inverse and erythrodermic type, the most common one. More severe and deforming erosive arthropathy is present in coexisting HIV patients, and they are generally refractory to conventional treatment. This point I'm again highlighting because patient is not responding to the conventional treatment. So we digged into the history and found it to be immunocompromised status. Abrupt onset and rapid progression and number of joints affected tends to increase with time. Next slide. And uh, since he had two types of arthritis, most typical presentation of reactive arthritis, that of seronegative peripheral oligoarthritis, predominantly involving the lower extremities, usually accompanied by anthesitis. Mucocutaneous features are common, classically keratoderma blerinogicum and sarcinate balinitis. Now, one thing interesting is HLA B27 is found in 80 to 90 percent of Caucasians with HIV associated reactive arthritis. While contrary, studies of Africans with HIV-associated reactive arthritis have found nearly all to be HLA-B27 negative. Next slide. So, the take-home message, my conclusion is NSAID remains the first-line treatment for HIV-associated arthritis. DMRDs are again rarely required due to self-limited nature of the disease. You treat the HIV, you build up the immunocompromised state up and the disease is treated itself. This is in contrast with other forms of arthropathy found in association with HIV infection, arthritis of undifferentiated SPA, and indeed all spondyloarthropathy can improve significantly with highly active antiretroviral treatment alone. Next slide. In case of unresponsive arthritis, the point, the take home message is always consider immunocompromised state like HIV. Coexistence of two different arthritis can be seen, though very rare, in the same individual. HLA B27 positivity favors more of reactive arthritis than of psoriatic arthritis. HIV arthropathy responds well to heart rather than initiating DMRDs and steroids. Thank you. Thank you all the speakers for your wonderful cases. Uh, I would like to make some remarks on this occasion. Uh, firstly, it is about the baseline screening for ANA when it comes for uh, uh, starting anti-TNF. In West, most of the guidelines do recommend and it is done in practice. I have had a case of uh, anti-TNF related Suicidis, uh, similar to Dr. Abhishek's, uh, after five years of being on anti-TNF, uh, my work was presented in British Society of Rheumatology 2017. Uh, at the time, it was uh, uh, like uh, his uh, literature review. It is zero conversion, but actual lupus is very rare. Uh, but doing baseline ANA screening is always helpful, and it would be helpful for future uh, data. Uh, if actual patients, if patients do develop uh, SLE or lupus. Uh, coming to the serocytes dose, uh, the so 15 milligram, that was enough for his case. That was lucky. The patient was discharged within five days. In our case, the steroid requirement was much higher. So we have to be mindful. And when I checked with Dr. Abhishek, he felt that there was worry of uh, coexisting or possible underlying TB, uh, so they started on the lowest possible, uh, which could be practical here in Indian scenario. So coming to other two cases of Dr. Nina and Dr. Somya, it reminds us how important it is to do the baseline, uh, again, go back to our basics and do the baseline infection screen. 
including hepatitis B, C, HIV before starting DMARS, ideally, uh, or if not, when we suspect things when they are not going as uh, we expect them to go. Uh, viral load needs to be monitored. So when patients on hepatitis C screening, they have the three, uh, monthly treatment. Uh, uh, we have to repeat the viral load at the end of three months. And also, at least after uh, three months of being on the uh, DMARDs, just to ensure that there is sustained uh, viral load, which is uh, not detectable. And finally, we should not forget uh, about coexisting two types of arthritis, be it psoriasis and gout in the past presentations or uh, HIV or, and uh, reactive arthritis. So in the interest of time, I'm uh, requested to move ahead. So we will answer all the questions uh, as much as possible through chat or uh, through email. Uh, so I would uh, request the audience to bear with me. Certificates will be available in the afternoon after one o'clock till evening today. Once again, thank you for the wonderful cases and thank you the organizers. Thank you. Over to you, sir. It's my pleasure to introduce a good friend of mine, Dr. Ramesh Joyce, who after his uh, training in rheumatology in England, is a senior consultant rheumatologist at Vikram Hospital, Bangalore, and he's a past secretary of Indian Rheumatology Association, Karnataka chapter. He has more than 30 index publications in national and international journals. Over to you, Dr. Ramesh. Um, thank you, sir. So at the outset, I'd like to thank Dr. Vinod Ravindran, Ajit Nalwade, Mohit, and all the organizers of World Rheumatology Forum. It's been a fantastic experience for me to listen to those lovely cases that my colleagues have been presenting. So my job today is to see what is holistic care for psoriatic arthritis in India. And to do that, what I'm going to do is to see what I, we remember Professor Atul Diyodar saying that there's a lot to be published from India or uh, from the uh, Asian countries. So what I've tried to do is to amalgamate our own publications from India and see how best can we utilize that in everyday practice to give holistic care for patients with psoriatic arthritis. We have been told um, by um, the experts that um, treat to target is very important to sustain either a remission or low disease activity in patients with psoriatic arthritis, although till today, nobody knows what is the best definition for remission in psoriatic arthritis and what would be the ideal, effective, low-cost regimens to achieve this. So we have to understand that one of the biggest problems we face is under, so that psoriatic arthritis is an undiagnosed disease and this uh, poor diagnose, diagnosis can come from various places you look at dermatology clinics, it has been shown from a study by in Dublin that 29% of psoriatic patients in dermatology clinics had undiagnosed arthritis. Prepare study was a large multi-center study across Europe and North America involving 34 dermatology centers. And it showed that one third of patients seen in these places had undiagnosed psoriatic arthritis. Labeling patients as psoriatic arthritis, rheumatologists could also be making mistakes. We could confuse psoriasis with other skin diseases. From a patient perspective with psoriasis, those who go to the dermatology OPDs may not consider it important to uh, forthrightly uh, tell their musculoskeletal symptoms uh, to skin doctors because it may not be their domain. And also the fact that muscular disease can easily be ignored. And then you come to the community, orthopedics or physicians are more familiar with polyarticular rheumatoid as opposed to polyarticular psoriasis, psoriatic arthritis or oligoarticular psoriatic arthritis. So hence, more likely that psoriatic arthritis is going to be missed. And obviously, needless to say, we are all aware that psoriatic arthritis presents in different domains. So that makes diagnosis even more complicated and easy to be missed. The, one of the dreaded uh, consequences of delayed diagnosis of psoriatic arthritis, even if the delay is within just six months, barely six months, is arthritis mutilans. As shown in this study, that the incidence of arthritis mutilans was the highest 
when the disease was when there was a delay in diagnosis for more than 6 months needless to say that there were other things like erosion sacroiliitis so on and so forth so how do we optimize care for psoriatic patients in india that is the question uh, a holistic care for our patients one of the most important uh, aspects of this is cross talk with dermatologists so at a regional level local level doing meetings with dermatologists or if feasible doing combined clinics with dermatologists could be one of the answers so the dermatologist and rheumatologist both have an occasion to diagnose patients with psoriasis and inflammatory arthritis depending on what presents first to their respective outpatients optimizing control of cutaneous disease and articular disease and screening for at risk population and ensuring compliance and taking care of other issues so in order to achieve holistic care there are many india specific unmet and professor atul deodar did highlight some of these things so you might find that there are a couple of slides that my uh, talk has an overlap with professor deodar's i didn't know he was going to show those so uh, please bear with me so we all agree that there are a lot of unmet needs when it comes to us giving good care to our patients one is that of lack of trained professionals poor medical education even now rheumatology rheumatology is not part of the main curriculum of medical students access to healthcare we've already spoken we have already spoken about challenges posed by alternative systems of medicine late diagnosis huge patient load in our opds self paying versus medical insurance doctor shopping doctor google are peculiarities that are restricted mostly to india and a lack of a very effective patient support group who can be a great voice for patients and meet needs so when whatever holistic care we plan to do should be centered around patients so a patient centric approach is important listening to patient expectations and ensuring adherence in order to enhance effectiveness of therapy so a shared decision making is where we should shift our focus in a uh, future so when it comes to india centric holistic care my um, the next part of my talk is going to be focused on two main domains one is about what is the local disease burden we are seeing and what are the therapeutics that might work for us so i will be leaving out biologics completely from my talk because we all have debated enough about the cost of biologics so the karnataka psoriatic arthritis cohort um um was a prospective open labeled cohort um which was uh, across 17 rheumatology centers in karnataka where uh, daily life uh, care was mirrored in the data and data was collected on psoriatic patients successive psoriatic arthritis patients who came to the opd and it was shown that polyarticular disease and oligoarticular disease formed the bulk in this tertiary care centers which all of these 17 centers were and majority of the patients if you see or nearly 50% of the patients had high and moderate disease moderate to high disease activity so the message you get from uh, an assessment of the karnataka psoriatic arthritis cohort was you had a patient cohort which had polyarticular and oligoarticular disease predominantly with moderate to high disease activity and surprisingly we had bulk of patients with mild psoriasis probably because there's a referral bias here similar disease burden has been enumerated by other publications from india the first one ramesh kumar et al is a part of aman sharma's group from chandigarh a cohort of 1000 odd patients were only about eight, uh, psoriasis patients were only about 8.7% of patients had arthritis majority of these were polyarthritis like our study whereas uh, equal numbers had spondyl arthritis which we did not see and another cohort from this one is from kashmir which is a dermatology cohort which looked at um, around 150 patients where symmetrical polyarthritis was the commonest presentation so this enumerates whatever data we have as far as disease burden in the country is concerned so the therapeutics is challenging without the use of biologics to achieve low disease activity or remission as has been enumerated by most recommendations so when it comes to the therapeutic challenge what have we been given so far 
GRAPA we, was one of the earliest recommendations that came up and all of us are familiar with this. This, is, this was published in 2016, although a lot of this is very difficult for us to follow. And then came the ACR recommendations. Now, if ACR recommendations from 2018, if I don't know how many of you have studied this whole document, it's as complex as this cartoon that I have shown here. The ACR recommendations is a fantastic document, but then a lot of it is bound by legality. So um, if you read the ACR recommendations, you will find a lot of legal language in it, and it's not easy to comprehend and put it into everyday practice. Then came ULAR, which is the latest one, the latest um, revision to the previous recommendations. And the phase one was to start either of the one D months. And if there was no response within three months, was to switch over to a biologic uh, DMARD. And that's a bit tough when it comes to us doing it in India. And there are a whole lot of other things in the flowchart, which I will not go into in detail. So what has been the practical utility of these clinical guidelines? The clinical guidelines have been made keeping in mind the availability of biologics freehand as even first line therapy. Um, so it suits resource rich countries. And if you look at even the first recommendation of the treatment naive psoriatic arthritis patients, the one of the recommendation is to start off straight away on TNF inhibitors if patients had poor prognostic features or severe disease, which is next to impossible. None of these recommendations have um, addressed the issue of combination of DMARTs. Now, combination of DMARTs has not been addressed by these recommendations, mainly because of lack of evidence. India has a lot of uh, biosimilars and intended copies. None of these have been studied in psoriatic arthritis. And the goalpost of remission, we all know, is very difficult to achieve with non-biologic therapies, especially those with severe and mod moderate to severe disease. So these are the challenges that lay in front of us. So this was shown by, uh, to address this um, situation in resource poor settings, this slide was also shown by Professor Deodor, where they tried to see if they could come up with some recommendations for resource poor settings. And unfortunately, due to lack of evidence, they could not come up with a management plan for patients in resource poor settings. And Aman Sharma was also part of this study group. And they stuck to the point that a combination of GRAPA and ULAR recommendations may best be followed where uh, possible. So let's look at what can we do in everyday clinical practice. And when we look at it, the first and the foremost, we all knew that a lot has been debated about poor evidence for methotrexate and psoriatic arthritis, although this is one of the most widely used drugs. So one of the best evidence was recently published by our own Nizam's group uh, by Professor Lisa Rajshaker's team with Stravan Kumar as the first author an open-label prospective study of methotrexate, 73 patients, and it was shown that major DAPSA was achieved in nearly 59% of the patients, and a moderate response was achieved in a majority of the patients, 74, but good response was achieved in a minority of patients. Similarly, minimal disease activity was achieved in nearly 60% of patients, Passive response 75 was also achieved in three-fourths of patients. So methotrexate was a good option. And this is one of the very good studies which has been now been quoted widely across international literature on methotrexate for psoriatic arthritis. Uh, Uma Karjigi uh, presented an abstract from Karnataka psoriatic arthritis cohort on the use of methotrexate for psoriatic arthritis. And we had similar results uh, from the, like what was seen in the Nizam's group. And nearly 60% of our patients were on methotrexate monotherapy. And DAPSA response of less than 14, which is moderate response, was seen in nearly uh, half of the patients. And most of these patients were on more than 15 milligrams of methotrexate. What about combination therapy in Indian patients? Can we try methotrexate plus leflunamide? This was also presented by Uma in Iracon last year at Pondicherry. 378 consecutive patients of psoriatic arthritis from the Karnataka Psoriatic Arthritis Register, which looked at methotrexate plus leflunamide versus methotrexate alone. It was shown that methotrexate was a very good drug However, the conclusion was that adding leflunamide for patients who were already on methotrexate did not give added benefits in our cohort of patients with psoriatic arthritis. 
So those are the numbers for those of you uh, who are interested. One other um, cheap drug that is available for us is um, uh, Apremilast. The PALACE trials showed that Apremilast was effective in biologically naive, biologically experienced, and biologic failures. However, there are some issues, diarrhea in a significant proportion of patients, unknown effect on structural progression, and less effective than biologics. So we tried to answer this question about in from the Karnataka psoriatic arthritis cohort, if uh, apromelast could be used as the first choice DMARD in combination of, uh, with methotrexate in patients with psoriasis or psoriatic arthritis. We had through three groups of patients, those who were in combo with leflunomide, those who were in combo with sulfasalazine, and those who were in combo with apromelast. So this exactly mirrors everyday clinical practice. And we showed that whatever drug you used, as far as arthritis was concerned, it did not make a big difference combining them. The, um, the efficacy was the same. However, what I have highlighted here in yellow, that for psoriasis, the combination of methotrexate and apromelase was probably the best compared to the other two drug combination. However, there was good if moderate efficacy across all the three combinations. So this is a good therapeutic choice for those patients with moderate to severe disease. Um, monitoring disease activity is a challenge. We looked at to see if HACDI or the Indian version, that is the Pune version of um, HAC, um, can it be applied in our patients with psoriatic arthritis? And it was shown that HAC could be effectively employed to assess outcomes. And in spite of being on therapy for at least six months, half of our patients had moderate to significant disability as assessed by HACC, suggesting that there is still leftover high disease burden in our patients despite six months of therapy. The situation in India is now complicated. After DCGI approved um, tofastinib for the treatment of psoriatic arthritis in August this year, and just two weeks ago, we had a flood of brands coming up. So we know that Ravindran is going to give a prize at the end of this conference for somebody who names all the available tofastinib brands um, in, uh, that are available in India today. So it's as confusing as that. You can put tofa and anything else after that, and it will suit a local brand. So I thought it might be worthwhile to um, you know, look at the data of tofastinib because now that so much of tofastinib is available in India and DCGI has given an approval, why don't we look at it? Opal Broaden and Opal Beyond were the two studies, phase three studies with the original tofastinib that was Zelzans. And this was in patients who were uh, conventional DMARD resistant and those who were TNF inadequate responders. And then those, they, we also had an adalimumab comparative arm in the Opal Broaden. And Opal Balance was an open label extension of these two studies. And what were the um, conclusions? That in a proportion, significant proportion of patients, um, so tofastinib therapy met the primary endpoint, which was ACR20 response. And this was comparable to adalimumab. The response was marginally lesser in TNF inadequate responders, but it did also um, work more so the ACR 20 and 50 responses, and you could not get a very good ACR 70 response in these patients. And the onset of action, it was rapid and joint symptoms were relieved as early as two weeks and it was sustained in patients. And other domains of psoriatic arthritis did well in comparison to adalimumab. And this was um, enthesitis as well as dactylitis. However, what is the role of tefastinib for plaque psoriasis? Because we are trying to look at a common agent to treat both. OPT compare was a randomized trial which looked at 12-week data. And was shown that tofastinib 10 mg was found to be 10 mg BID, I mean, was found to be non inferior to etanercept, that is, it was similar to etanercept, but tofastinib 5 mg BID, what we conventionally use to treat arthritis, was not shown to be non inferior. In other words, tofastinib 10 mg BID was a good dose for uh, plaque psoriasis, whereas the conventional doses we use, 5 mg BID, was not a great option. 
So, however, the 10MG BID is not licensed for use in arthritis by the DCGI. Um, and also, tofastinib radiographic progression. Um, well, the Opal Broaden had a sub-analysis of radiographic outcomes. And it was shown that more than 90% of patients showed radiographic non-progression. However, it is important to note that the overall rate of radiographic non-progression -prog was low across all the patients in the trial. So we still need data on radiographic progression from tofastinib. And Opal Broaden also showed that Lee's, Lee's enthesitis index was found to be the response was better with the 10MG group rather than the 5MG group. So skin disease and 10, um, as well as enthesitis responded to higher doses. One of the problems we have is to sustain patients on treatment and we stop and st restart treatment. So how safe is it to restart or how effective is it to restart um, after stopping treatment um, in, with tofastinib? So this OPT retreatment trial was in psoriatic patients and what it was shown was that tofastinib could be efficacious after withdrawal and retreatment in at least 60% of the patients capturing the effect in this particular trial of psoriasis. So I still don't know what is the effective conclusion because 40% of the patients did not show the same response. Now, I don't know the reasons for this, whether there's any immunological phenomenon that prevents response in all of them, or whether the flare was so bad when the drug was withdrawn, whether the same dose was not effective. But however, there is one Japanese phase three trial, which was predominantly in psoriasis and a small number of patients with arthritis, which showed that even tofastinib 5 milligram BID, a lot of the 70% of the patients achieved good response, which was PASI 75. And PGA was also good in tofastinib 5 milligram group. So the verdict, you know, if you read this Japanese trial, they found a good response with a conventional dose of tofastinib in patients with um, uh, bad psoriasis also in addition to arthritis. So the bottom line is we could use uh, tofastin 5 milligram BID, but then if you have somebody with a very bad skin disease, maybe you could use 10 milligram BID with patient's consent for a short period of time, like how we use etanacept 50 milligrams twice, uh, twice in a week or adalimumab, adalimumab 40 milligrams weekly for those with very severe skin disease. <laughs> The last part of my talk, I'll just take a couple of minutes extra, uh, Chairperson. Um, one of the important aspects of psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis that is under, under um, uh, treated is the comorbidities. Psoriatic march is the term that is used these days. And it is seen that those patients with arthritis tend to have more comorbidities than those compared to skin disease alone. And those with skin disease alone have more compared to the general population. And this includes insulin resistance, obesity, cardiovascular events, cerebrovascular events, and metabolic syndrome. So what data do we have from India in this respect? This is going to be my presentation in the next last three slides. The Karnataka Psoriatic Arthritis Cohort Study published uh, a poster authored by Chanakya as the first author on the prevalence of comorbidities in psoriatic and their arthritis and their impact on disease measures. I've already described the cohort to you. A comprehensive psoriatic comorbidity index was calculated for all the patients who were enrolled and it was correlated with the disease activity measures, which was PASI, DAPSA and HACDI. It was shown that patients with comorbidities had significantly longer duration of arthritis than those who did not have. The um, um, nearly 40% of our patients with psoriatic arthritis had one or more comorbidities. Hack di was significantly more in patients with comorbidities. And one of the important comorbidities that we saw, the top three were hypertension, diabetes, and dyslipidemia. And it's important to see that nearly 40% of psoriatic arthritis patients had comorbidities. We had earlier published from the KRAC study, that is Karnataka Rheumatoid Arthritis Cohort, and we compared the comorbidities between rheumatoid arthritis and psoriatic arthritis. It was shown that the prevalence of hypertension and diabetes was almost the same in both these cohorts, although published literature says that comorbidities are more so in psoriatic patients. 
And what about other data from India? The first one that I've shown, Ali, is from Mangalore. Metabolic syndrome was seen in about 63% of patients with psoriatic arthritis compared to 33% with psoriasis alone. Aman Sharma's group published again from PGI that metabolic syndrome was more common in Asian Indian patients with psoriatic arthritis, especially those with long-standing disease and active disease. And finally, published from Ramchandra uh, Medical College from Chennai, which looked at an increased prevalence of fatty liver. This is a very important uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver, very important aspect because a lot of our patients go on methotrexate an increased prevalence of non-alcoholic fatty liver in patients with psoriatic arthritis. It was shown that NAFLD was higher in psoriatic patients and more so in psoriatic arthritis patients. And also those who had more severe NAFLD um, had more chances of steatosis, NASH and fibrosis scores. And so obviously we have to be cautious that there's a very high prevalence of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease in our patients, Indian patients. And this was a study from South India. And my last slide, um, obviously atherosclerosis is another important aspect of its in psoriatic arthritis. And this earlier publication by Ashit Singhle and group from Chandigarh, which demonstrated that carotid intima media thickness was significantly higher in psoriatic patients compared to controls. And there were a lot of things like uh, flow-mediated dilatation, EPCs, and um, HDL cholesterol were significantly reduced, and carotid intima media, intima media thickness positively correlated with inflammatory markers. And it has been shown uh, that accelerated atherosclerosis and endothelial dysfunction is common in Indian patients with psoriatic arthritis in this small study. Ramesh, can so, you wind up? Yes, sir. This is my last slide. So, um, um, so to sum up, um, what I would say is, so holistic care for psoriatic arthritis amongst Indian patients is challenging. Obviously, not, without using biologics, it's not easy. Um, however, with the available options and with available published literature, I've just given you a broad view of what we could be doing with our patients to achieve holistic care. Um, in India. Thank you very much. Thank, uh, thank you, Ramesh, for the well-studied talk. It was very informative and useful for our regular practice. Because we are short of time, Ramesh, we may not take questions now. Uh, so whichever questions are coming, we'll email it to you. So we'll be putting it on the WRF website, the answers, questions and the answers. And uh, for the last session, I would invite... Uh, Dr. Suvrat Arya, who is the gold medalist for his DM in rheumatology from STPGI. And now he's a consultant rheumatologist at Dr. Arya's Care and JP Hospital, Noida. Over to you, Suvrat. Okay. Uh, thanks a lot, organizers, for giving me this opportunity. So let's change gears and move on to a different disease. So I'm presenting a case of 26-year-old lady who was diagnosed as SLE with class 3 lupus nephritis in 2015. At uh, that point of time, she was treated with cyclophosphamide as per Eurolupus protocol and was given maintenance in the form of azathioprine. Uh, the compliance was not good and treatment was irregular. In July 2017, she had a renal flare in which she had high blood pressure, elevated uh, serum creatinine and active urinary sediments. Uh, she was offered a kidney biopsy, but the patient declined. So she was treated as rapidly progressive glomerular nephritis with methylprednisolone pulse and cyclophosphamide was initiated as per NIH protocol. In October 2017, she received third dose of cyclophosphamide after which she developed generalized tonic-clonic seizures with transient weakness of the left side. And after four days, she landed up in the emergency department with high-grade fever recurrent episodes of generalized tonic-clonic seizures, headache, and left-sided hemiplegia. And this point of time, she was admitted in the ward. Next slide, please. So at the time of presentation, she was tachycardic. There was high-grade fever. Her blood pressure was 130 by 76, but she was on antihypertensive medications. Her CNS examination was remarkable with left-sided hemiplegia with facial palsy, and the left plantar was mute. Other systemic examinations were within normal range. Next slide, please. So 
in a young lady who has lupus has active nephritis and has presented to the emergency with hemiparesis these were the following differentials which we kept either it could be thrombotic cva cortical venous thrombosis ic bleed and also a possibility of cns vasculitis and cns infections were kept next slide please yeah so from the ct which was done in the emergency there was a large hypodensity which was present in the right parieto occipital region you can clearly see in the top images that there was also effacement of the posterior horn of the right lateral ventricle and there was effacement of the uh, sulci as well in the lower images you can see that there is some hyperdensity present inside of this large hyperdensity so the initial impression of the ct was given as hemorrhagic infarct and she was further evaluated next slide please so mri brain was done which showed a large t2 hyperintense lesion in the same region that is right parieto occipital region and swan and diffusion weighted uh, sequences were done to exclude ic bleed and to rule out an acute infarct so these two sequences excluded that there was no ic bleed and no infarct next slide please mr venography was uh, also done considering a possibility of cvt but it was normal and contrast enhanced t1 weighted images which are shown in the lower images they showed that there was some perilesional enhancement seen and in the lower image you can also see how clearly there is effacement of the various sulci on the right side as we compare to the left side so a final impression of cerebritis with perilesional edema was given but this was not very characteristic of cns lupus that also we kept in mind next slide please uh, on further evaluation she was found to be having anemia her hb was 8.4 serum creatinine was mildly elevated at 1.31 albumin was low other metabolic parameters were normal urine showed active urinary sediments in form of proteinuria hematuria and pyuria anti ds dna was elevated apla profile was negative serum complements were low crp was elevated x ray and echo were within normal limit next slide please so we went ahead and did a csf examination which showed uh, leukocytosis with predominant lymphocytes uh, protein was elevated at 85 considering the corresponding blood sugar the csf glucose was low the bacterial culture the fungal culture and afb smear and culture all were negative so having done all these investigations we still were not sure what we were dealing with could it all be lupus because she after all has an active disease or is it something else the mri picture was not very uh, conclusive to suggest any cns lupus and cns csf analysis though was abnormal still could not give us a clear picture next slide please so while we were still scratching our heads that what is the cause of this abnormality the blood culture sent from the emergency department came and it showed listeria monocytogenes which was sensitive to ampicillin she was already on broad spectrum antibiotics because of high grade fever ampicillin was added she became febrile within next 4 days and left hemiparesis improved to 4 plus by 5 and she was all ambulant by herself at the time of discharge with the final diagnosis of sle with active nephritis with cns listeriosis next slide please so highlights of this case is we all know that not all hemiparesis in lupus are cva cns infections can mimic them and we must always exclude them blood culture may be an important indicator when csf picture is abnormal but it is inconclusive to confirm the cause or the bacterial pathogen and as we all know immunosuppression can cause uh, infections by unusual opportunistic organisms so we should always be on look for them next slide please so unusual clinical picture deterioration despite the patient being on immunosuppressive therapy and imaging which is not typical of cva should always prompt us to look for any kind of unusual infection in the brain and early diagnosis and prompt treatment would usually lead to a good outcome next slide please so uh, briefly i would discuss about Uh, this bacteria which is listeria monocytogenes which we don't encounter very commonly it is a motile aerobic gram positive intracellular bacillus so if we look at the image on the right hand side of the screen this shows that how over evolution this bacteria has learned to exploit the cytoskeleton 
to move from one cell to another so when the bacteria enters the uh, cell it causes lysis of the vacuole it replicates inside the cytoplasm and the protein act a which is present on this bacteria it causes polymerization of actin behind the bacteria and thus it helps the it helps in moving the bacteria from one cell to other without coming in contact with the extracellular fluid so it completely evades any detection or attack by antibodies so humoral immunity may not be able to tackle this kind of an infection cell mediated immunity is the one which is needed for such kind of an intracellular pathogen but in most of the patients or in most of the persons who are immunocompetent the most common symptom being diarrhea it is self resolving and does not require any particular treatment however if there is a vulnerable group like neonates elderly or immunocompromised people this can cause to fulminant infections like cns infection as in this case which can present as meningitis meningoencephalitis or even cerebritis a blood culture and csf culture can be seen positive in 60 and 80% respectively and ampicillin is the drug of choice and duration of therapy is typically between 4 uh, to 6 weeks next slide please so coming to what data we have for cns listeriosis in lupus uh, this uh, series published in 2013 talks of 26 patients which they had collated and the most common presentation uh, of cns listeriosis was meningitis and meningoencephalitis was the least common the most common clinical presentation was fever and focal neurological signs was least common which was seen in around 41.6% patients like in our patient uh most of the patient that is 46% the lupus activity was not uh, reported we did not have any data to comment whether lupus was active or not but this is important 87% of uh, these patients were on immunosuppressive therapy with steroids and other immunosuppressive in another 43% and the mortality was very high around 27% in the patients who had cns listeriosis and focal neurological deficit was seen in around 7% some of these diagnoses were made after the uh, demise of the patient on biopsy or the uh, tissue from the brain next slide please so this is another uh, uh, data which showed neuroinvasive listeriosis now this uh, group has collated data from 1990 to 2014 and these are not lupus patients this is overall neuroinvasive listeriosis which they saw in 100 patients so not surprisingly 54% that is more than the half of these patients who had neuroinvasive listeriosis were on immunosuppressive therapy some were having some uh, hematological malignancy post transplant or lupus so immunosuppression is a very important risk factor for developing neuroinvasive listeriosis they also delineated poor prognostic factors for mortality and neurological sequelae so they found out that delayed initiation of treatment and presence of seizures these two were significantly associated with mortality and for neurological sequelae delayed initiation of treatment and bacteremia were associated with neurological uh, uh, sequelae so with this i conclude my case next slide please and i would like to thank uh, my faculty uh, professor amita agarwal and professor vikas agarwal who were uh, case in charge when we managed this case at sdpj lucknow and also i would like to thank dr hari krishnan who was uh, my colleague while we were managing this case and also department of microbiology and radio diagnosis uh, thank you thanks uh, subrat uh, for the brilliantly managed case and uh, well presented and very clearly con- mes- conveyed message as all of us know when somebody comes with acute lupus uh, with neuropsychiatric symptoms fixing the diagnosis to lupus or infections or a metabolic cause is really really uh, difficult uh, so but i think you have done it very successfully uh, uh, and uh, surat so, so uh, we are running out of time uh, so we may limit the questions now uh, as it, we'll take it as it comes because people have to think about it and ask the questions uh, we'll send it to you by mail um, before i hand it over to uh, the, the organizers dr mohit uh, 
It was a very fantastic uh, day, Sunday we had today with this academic feast. Uh, for everybody who needs to download a certificate, uh, you have to download it from the site where you're viewing the uh, program today itself. So I think by today night, you should be able to download it. You should do it before that. Uh, so thank you, everyone. Over to the organizers. Good afternoon, my dear friends and colleagues. I first of all like to thank WRF for giving me the opportunity to express my gratitude on such a special day in the calendar of Rheumatology Forum. WRF's annual meeting has become one of the most popular day in the Rheumatology calendar in India. And today we have hosted one of the biggest digital conference. We had more than 1,200 attendees on day one, and even larger number of delegates participated today in a huge success story that it has become. On behalf of WRF, I express my sincere and heartfelt thanks to Professor Atul Devda, Professor John Matthew, Professor Vikas Agrawal, Professor Chris Edwards, Dr. Dharmanand, Dr. Ramesh Joyce, Dr. Damodaran, Dr. Raj Kiran, Dr. Meha, Dr. Ganga, all the chairpersons and moderators for the meeting and all the presenters. We had two days of true academic feast, mainly focusing in rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic arthritis and difficult cases in SLE. Our mission in WRF is to involve young and talented rheumatologists from all across India and to provide them a platform to interact with the best internationally renowned rheumatologists. We in WRF value all of you and from all across India. Please do write to us for your suggestions and hopefully we will have a bigger and better event next year. I thank with utmost sincerity and humility to all the respected teachers and seniors, Dr. V. R. Joshi sir, Dr. Mahendra Nath sir, Dr. Chopra sir, and the attendees who blessed us today in their, with their presence. I'd like to thank the organizing committee led by Dr. Ajit Nalwade and Team Pune, with his colleagues from Maharashtra, Dr. Vimlesh. I'd like to give a special thanks to Dr. Akshat Pandey, Dr. Mohit Goel for their sincere hard work and dedications. Well done, Dr. Mohit and Dr. Akshat. I would like to thank Dr. Vinod Ravindran, our scientific chair. Without him, this event would have not been possible. His discipline, and motivation sets an example for all of us. Thank you very much once again, Vino. Thank you our digital partners from IPCA Laboratories, as well as from Sancheti Hospital Rheumatology TV. Finally, I want to thank all of us and all of you whose name I have missed today. Have a great weekend and goodbye. Thank you. We offline now.